My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Monday, February 13th, 2017. And I'm here with Stefan and Mary Krieger in their home in New York City. And we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Steph and Mary, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. Yes. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly your involvement in Chavarot Shalom, and also the impact that the Chavarot has had on your own lives and the Jewish community beyond. So I'd like to start by talking with each of you about your personal and family backgrounds and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you first got involved uh, with Chavarot Shalom. So Steph, let's start with you, and let's begin with your family when you were growing up. Uh, you were born in 1946 in Bradford, Pennsylvania? That's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about your family when you were growing up? Uh, I had a, uh, a brother who's five years older than I am and a sister who's seven years older than I am. Uh, Bradford, at, Bradford at the time was, uh, had about 17,000 people, 40 Jewish families. Uh, the uh, the uh, city had two shuls, uh, a reform shul and a conservative one. There was an orthodox one not uh, that distant away from when I, uh, uh, when I was born. Um, and we belonged to the conservative shul. Tell us about your parents. Uh, my dad, Norman, uh, was uh, a, uh, at that time, um, at the University of Michigan, uh, chemistry uh, graduate. Uh, during the Depression, he had come to Bradford because uh, he couldn't get a job, so he worked for his father-in-law. Um, um, my mom uh, was a Phi Beta Kappa, University of Michigan graduate. Um, she uh, was a stay-at-home mom until I was eight, and then she began working as a uh, copywriter for the local radio station in Bradford. She always wanted to be an author. Um, she always wanted to, to write, and and she would send to magazines manuscripts uh, and they would be rejected. And she, uh, she wasn't happy about that. How would you describe the Jewish environment in your home? Uh, it, it was uh, a, it, it, Judaism was part of a day-to-day -day, uh, in the home. Uh, we always had uh, a Shabbos meal uh, uh, together, uh, although during the meal we would uh, always, every other week, uh, talk with my dad's parents in Batavia, New York, on the phone during the meal, was as if they would be brought into the meal. Um, my dad worked on Shabbos, his, <laughs> my grandfather, his boss, uh, uh, was a real slave driver. My, my grandfather, uh, I think, thought of himself as uh, a traditional Jew, but on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, um, he would work, have his, um, my father and uh, his, uh, my, mo my mother's brother-in-laws, who also worked for my grandfather, uh, forced them to come in. But my grandfather would put uh, newspapers over the window of his store. And I mean, I, th I think- So that no one would so see, would see. Would work but That would be one, although my father would say it was so God wouldn't see. Uh, <laughs> that, and I think in some ways for my grandfather, probably it was that. Um, uh, we were the, one of the only three families in Bradford that kept kosher, and that was something my uh, my parents were very proud of. Uh, they would get uh, food shipped in, kosher food shipped in from uh, Philadelphia. Uh, we would go to the train station, pick it up, it had dry ice, and we would take it to a, a frozen food locker um, in Bradford. Um, my sister had the first bat mitzvah, bas mitzvah, uh, in Bradford. Uh, it must have been 1952. 
um, on uh, Shavuos. Is that um, a conservative evening. synagogue? It was a conservative synagogue. The rabbi at the time, we had uh, multiple rabbis. Every other year there'd be a new rabbi. This rabbi was Orthodox, and Orthodox Micha, but he wanted my sister to have this bas mitzvah, uh, and uh, on the first first evening of um, of Shavuos, uh, she she had her bas mitzvah. My sister hated it. Uh, she was forced to do it. Um, this was kind of uh, an occasion more for my parents than my sister. Um, uh, she uh, gave up any sort of observance after that. Um, I would go to shul probably every week uh, on Shabbos morning. Uh, it was a, a lot of old men, uh, uh, although uh, probably those men were younger than I am now. Uh, but uh, um, I, I don't know why I liked it, because <laughs> I had nothing in common. Um, but I felt uh, a kind of warmth there. Um, and uh, we, would, we would have to call up people, including my grandfather, uh, to send one of his uh, 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 son-in-laws to, uh, uh, to the shul so that we would have a minion. Um, he, uh, uh, I, I, from that age, I loved Dovening. Um, and uh, my dad, uh, I think my dad's the one that instilled me with it. I can remember going very early in the morning on a Yom Kippur morning to shul, see my father in the front row, davening and kind of looking at me quizzically why I would want to be there. But um, my dad, I don't think, believed in God, or if he did, he was an agnostic. Um, but there was something about davening that, um, that was really important to him. Um, when he uh, passed away, uh, his last probably 10, 15 years of his life, he dove in three times a day. Um, and when he died, uh, on the bed stand next to him uh, was a Chabad Siddur, a, uh, uh, a boxer, a conservative Siddur, um, a Reconstructionist Siddur, and a Jewish Humanist magazine. And that's, that's my dad. Yeah. Um, How did you feel about dovening when you were young? I, I liked it, and I never, I never, th I, I thought it was kind of part of my, just my nature. I mean, I, when I was 15, 16, I was right, I, I began starting with my bar mitzvah, I put on tefillin almost every day that you need to put on tefillin in my life. There were f few periods where maybe for a month or so I didn't, but I've been doing it. Um, and I began when I was 14, 15 to write my own liturgy. I'm not sure why, because at base I'm not so sure whether there's a God, uh, but um, it gave me a sense, um, uh, a sense of meaning. Um, yeah. uh, you moved to a different uh, community when you were 12? When I, when I, yeah, when I was uh, 12, 13, we moved from Bradford to Amherst, New York, which is a suburb outside of Buffalo. Um, it was a, a pretty drastic change, at least the way I felt about it. Um, that uh, it was an upscale Jewish community, uh, well, not Jewish community, just upscale community. Uh, the Jewish community that we belonged to at the time was a reconstruction of shul. My dad, who was a chemist, a scientist, liked uh, classical reconstructionism. My mom couldn't stand it. My mom always, she was always searching for proof that there was an afterlife. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the guest rabbis for uh, Yom Kippur one year uh, uh, had a sermon uh, on uh, the life hereafter, and actually my mom uh, 
in her scrapbook. She has a copy of that sermon. It was, it, it was really uh, an important part of, uh, of, the, uh, of, her, of her religious life. She, um, she believed in a personal God. Uh, and so Reconstructionism wasn't something up her alley, but the egalitarian part was. Um, from the get-go, uh, uh, you know, not, not until now did I think perhaps the bat mitzvah for my sister had something to do with my mom. Um, uh, she had a talus way before women had to lace them, um, and uh, so we we were part of this reconstructionist shul, and there couldn't have been anything better for me because I was I was going through a a crisis in belief. I did, did not believe uh, uh, that God created the world. Uh, I didn't believe uh, in an afterlife. Um, and this reconstruction of Shul just fit the bill for me. Um, I can remember one a Hebrew school teacher, Mel Davidson, Oliver Shalom. And Mel, um, uh, one morning, uh, Shabbos morning, we had uh, classes, was talking about uh, how you can be a Jew without believing in an afterlife. I remember running at the kiddish up to my mother and say, <laughs> saying this, of course, it appalled her. Uh, but um, it, it, it gave me the ability to keep a connection to Judaism. And I, I 14, 15, I was reading Mordecai Kaplan. Uh, and the rabbi, Rabbi Gainer. Nathan Gaynor, uh, of Shalom. Uh, he was oh, he was a classic uh, reconstructionist, and he, um, I mean, he would give sermons mocking um, <laughs> and mystics and supernaturalism, um, and I would just sit there uh, eating it up. Um, for me. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, a girl that I knew who was not uh, uh, Jewish, but um, we uh, we would always say goodbye to each other by saying, "May the principle of goodness and creativity be with you," which was the language of Mordecai Kaplan uh, for God. Uh, it um, uh, it kept me going, and, and during that time is when I wrote a morning governing for my, uh, when I put on to fill in, uh, which was very much uh, in a kind of reconstructionist trope. So you went to college in the mid-60s at the University of Chicago, and also were very involved in the Hillel there. These years, your college years, 1964 to 68, were a period of tremendous social ferment among American youth especially on college campuses. To what extent were you personally involved with and influenced by the major social and political movements of the 60s? Very much. Um, it was 65 when I began college. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I was uh, very involved. I, I was a latecomer. I was not that involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, but in the anti-war movement, uh, I, uh, I threw myself into. Uh, there was uh, a, uh, a very active SDS, Students for Democratic Society, at the University of Chicago. And I never really was part of the leadership of it, but I would always go to their activities. There were two sit-ins um, that had to do with uh, the Selective Service uh, uh, rent, uh, requiring uh, universities to rank male students. Um, and rank them in what way? Rank them uh, just in terms of uh, GPA. What was, um, and actually, uh, it, at first, I wondered why object to it, and it was Danny Leifer, uh, may rest in peace, the, the rabbi at Hillel at, at Chicago, who kind of urged me on, uh, helped me on with this, saying, well, there's no academic reason to just rank males. 
uh, you know, you can rank males and females, there might be some sort of, uh, of, of academic purpose, but to just do males is for no other reason than uh, to help uh, the, the military. Um, what, what use would the military have made of these rankings? What uh, the Selective Service did was that if you were ranked below, I think it was the top half of the class, you could be, uh, your draft deferment, uh, which was a 2S, would be revoked. So this was a student deferment. It was a, stu it was a way of uh, weeding out student deferments. Actually, some students at the University of Chicago were so low in terms of the male rank that they left um, and uh, so they could go to a school. Actually, Old Westbury was where I know somebody went, uh, where he could be closer to the top of the class. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a, a policy piece by the head of the Selective Service, General Hershey, called Channeling. Uh, that Ramparts magazine, uh, the leftist magazine at the time, had in which the purpose of ranking, the purpose of the deferment system was to channel uh, uh, men into particular professions uh, and those that just quite didn't make it would go into the military. Um, and so there was a big anti-rank uh, anti sit-in in 1966 and that was my first taste of, uh, of real live protest. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, at that point I became very involved with uh, going to, to anti-war protests. Uh, back in 1967, um, a friend of mine, uh, who was a member of the Chicago area draft resistors. Uh, we were talking, it was not far before the, the uh, high holidays. And um, he was talking to me about how having a deferment was actually discriminatory, keeping a deferment, the 2S. Um, and that I should not cooperate with the selective service system. And I mean, I don't think this is revised memory, but it was Yom Kippur, uh, where I thought to myself, I can't, I can not be part of uh, a system that discriminates against, uh, this channeling against blacks um, uh, who are the ones that are being sent over to be cannon fodder uh, while I'm at Chicago. Uh, and so uh, uh, on December 4th, 1967, I handed back my draft card uh, and, I re and I wrote a letter to the Selective Service, Ramsey Clark, uh, who was the Attorney General at the time, saying I'm not going to have anything to do uh, with the draft. And um, uh, I, and this was, this decision was really a private decision. I, I don't think I talked with anybody about it. I just, I kind of went through it. And then I went to Hillel to Shabbos morning services and I can remember Max Tickton, uh, uh, who was the director, who was the director uh, the, one of the two directors, taking me out to the kitchen and saying that he had heard this is what I had done and how proud he was. And I, that's, that's wrong. It's, it's, it's how much he supported what I did. That, um, I can still see his face. And it was a, a very important moment. Max, who unfortunately is not going to be able to be interviewed for this, Max was um, a CEO, a conscientious objector during World War II. Uh, and then after that, he, when the War of Independence came, he went over to fight the Israeli War of the, Independence. Right, the Israeli War of Independence. And so he was, um, he and his wife, I learned this at his funeral, met at a, um, a, at a meeting of Zionists uh, to discuss the issue, can you be a Zionist and a pacifist at the same time? So Max had gone through, well, 
had gone through. He was still going through the struggle, and he was uh, he was supporting me in what I was doing. It was it was a very important moment. Later that week, I met with uh, Danny Leifer, the other uh, director, and they both they both were wonderful to me through it. I, Did was there for you a religious component of your decision? Yeah, um, I mean, I. I mean, if you want, I can, I can show you my letter to the draft board in which I, I say it's my, um, this, is, uh, this is religiously motivated. I, I, there's some self-righteous language in it. Uh, you could say that you know, somebody who's 21 years old has a right to do that. But uh, uh, I, I said that, uh, you know, other people uh, had been persecuted because of their religious beliefs. Um, if this is what happens to me, this is what happens to me. Were you essentially applying for a CO status? No. I think, no. And that's where I, I think Max and I, or Max, what I did resonated with him. I was what's called a selective CO, that I, there are, there are wars I would fight in. Uh, at least that's what I said. Uh, and, but uh, this one I w wouldn't. And, the, uh, uh, the, the conscience of the rules then, and I think now, uh, only, you have to be a pacifist. I'm not a pacifist. Um, so, and then even if I was, I know people that were CEOs who, um, who did not, um, who would not accept the CEO because that in itself had a, a discriminatory uh, basis that, you know, there were certain upper class or upper middle class people that could get it, but not uh, uh, not a lower income people. Uh, what happened is I was uh, immediately uh, uh, sent notice that I was a 1A delinquent, which means I'm at the top of the list to be uh, drafted. Um, the I was visited by the FBI, um, this was like a week after I wrote my letter to Ramsey Clark. And I can remember after it, after they came to the door, um, uh, going up to my room and packing my bag to, to go off to jail. Uh, uh, and there was this lawyer, a wonderful man who I think in some ways probably has inspired me and in what I do, Carmen Petrino, um, may he rest in peace. And, um, uh, he had agreed to represent me. Um, um, he actually brought a case in federal court on behalf of me and uh, some other draft resistors in Buffalo that the selective service system was unconstitutional. It, 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 it was a totally bogus, bogus case in the sense that there was no way we were going to win, but he was trying just to, to help us have a voice to what a our position was. So I called Carmen Petrino. He said, don't worry. They won't arrest you until you refuse induction. Were you scared? I, 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 when I packed my bag, I was scared. But there was a part of me that was, uh, that felt like this is a mission that I have to do. And there was certainly a religious component. I remember, and I, I don't think, I don't think I, it's revised memory. I packed my tefillin and my towels um, with my stuff. Um, there was this, and, and God, there was an erotic component. There was this, you know, that I'm something, that I'm really doing something. But I think there was something very deep that this was, yeah, I'm gonna go off, and it'll, I'm doing it for a, for a, ver for a moral, Purpose. Um, I uh, I read lots of books at the time about uh, resistors during World War One and World War Two. Uh, one was about how to live in a prison, how to how to how to survive in prison. And, you know, make sure you get a subscription to the New York Times. This kind of stuff. Uh, and that's what I, uh, this man had been in Lewisburg, 
and I was I was going to do that. Um, and then, um, I mean, if if you want, I'll go fast forward to what happened with yeah, it. Please. Um, I Carmen Vitrino had me have administrative appeals uh, uh, through the selective service system to just continually confront them. And I did that. Continue to? To confront the system. And so I would go and I would tell my draft board why what they were doing was a war crime. Uh, and then, uh, so this is throughout 1968. Um, in March of 1969, I was in Havarat Shalom. And at, uh, by that time, I had met Mary. Um, on February 4th, 1968. And uh, uh, in March of 1969, I was going to be inducted. Uh, and I was not going to just let this go away and you know, not show up. I was going to go to the induction to confront the United States government. This was going to be my moment of saying uh, no. Now, at Havarat Alam, I could have gotten a divinity deferment as other, some other people in the Havara had. But I wasn't going to accept that either. I mean, that was really channeling. Um, and uh, so the night before uh, my uh, induction, Mary came in, my mom came in. Uh, my mom really became involved with anti-war stuff. Was she uh, supporting you in this? Very supportive. My dad. <laughs> when I first told him that I was going to prison, uh, kicked me out of the house. Um, but I mean, this was not the um, you know the, the, the Russian uh, 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 communist in the garret, uh, you know, living by candlelight. I ordered a cab <laughs> and went to my sister's house. Uh, and as time went on. He became very supportive. He wrote a letter in support of my um, of my resistance that is really kind of comical. You know, it, it, um, it just it was name calling. Just you know how how the system is attacking my son. My my mom was deeply involved with a group called clergy and uh, laymen at the time. It's laity now clergy and laymen against the war in Vietnam. Um, and uh, she was involved with rabbis and ministers uh, uh, in support of it. So she came in, Mary came in, and uh, throughout the night at Havarat Shalom, uh, there was, we had a tikkun. Uh, we had an all-night study session. Um, and different people, uh, Joey Reamer, Art Green, Zalman uh, led uh, sessions in which we studied text on peace. And then in the early morning, we davened, and I, this is the height of self-righteousness. Uh, we read from the Torah, Bert Jacobson read the section from the Torah on um, uh, Moses confronting Pharaoh. And uh, that was by Aaliyah. Uh, and then everybody marched me off to the bus to take me to the induction center. Um, and uh, I remember, uh, Joey actually said this later, Joey Reamer, uh, I wore kippah throughout this whole experience at the our Boston Army base. The bus took me to the Boston Army Base. I took the, you know, the intel intelligence exam. And then they give you a physical. And uh, I was the last person to get the physical. And it was, I believe, a Jewish doctor. I'm not sure what he was up to. But he said, my heart was beating 170 beats a minute. It was too fast. And he rejected me. Um, and it was a, a, a devastating moment for me um, because I wanted to refuse induction. I wanted that moment 
to say uh, no to the United States government. Um, I remember I called Art. Art picked me up. He was ha you know he was half asleep because he had been up all night long. He was very he didn't get me. He didn't understand it. Mary absolutely did not understand. No, oh, I was very happy. <laughs> uh, my mom was really happy, and I just I lashed out at her. Uh, but I, it was like, and I can remember Joy Reamer that night said to me. This is the first time in my life I've ever seen anyone with a kippah doing anything that was courageous. Uh, and that's the way they looked at it, and I looked at it that I had let myself down. You had let yourself down? Yes. My body had let myself down. That somehow I wasn't able to, to go through this, to get through this. And um, I... Uh, the next day, I met somebody from Boston Draft Resisters Group, which I had had very little to do. Again, I think much of my resistance. In Chicago, I had done some stuff with Chicago Area Draft Resisters, but I did nothing in Boston. And I went there to BDRG. And she said, well, now that you've gotten your personal little uh, craziness put aside, now start, now you have work to do. Uh, To this day, the resistance is a kind of defining um, experience for me. Uh, the day after the election, November 9th, I put my draft resistance button this back year, on. This, this year, year 20, this year I put. I have my old draft resistance button. I put it back on. Uh, Say why? And <laughs> for the record, this was the election of Donald Trump on November 8th, 2016. Um, it's a the the button is a an omega, uh, which is the um, electricians electronics symbol for resist, uh, res for resistance and electrons, and um, uh, uh, in electricity. And I think that for me uh, that I was back to where I was uh, back in 1968. Uh, although I think in a much, much darker way. Uh, and um, I think that now is a time where people have to be willing to go to jail. Um, to Not just kind of symbolic civil disobedience, but that when deportations are taking place, people have to be willing to put their bodies in front of the immigration officials and to stop the deportations, and I'm struggling. I think probably in those situations I will be the lawyers for them, but I think at some point um, I will, I might be arrested. When I, when I applied for the bar in Illinois, uh, I was, uh, usually if you apply for the bar, there's no uh, character and fitness interview. If there is, it's one person interviews you. For me, I had five people uh, in mind. And um, there was a one lawyer who was really beating me up, an other who was the brother of John Paul Stevens, uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, who was very sympathetic. Uh, but the one who was beating me up said, well, you would have fought for Israel, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is, is that since I'm not a Zionist, uh, it was it was not the question to ask me, but uh, uh, it was certainly had an anti-Semitic smell, um, and and then he said, uh, "Well, now that you're going to be a lawyer, are you going to get arrested?" And I hadn't thought that about that question until recently, and I think the the answer I gave was the right one. I said. I think I will be more con conscious of it, I'm more concerned about doing it uh, uh, as a lawyer because of what it would mean. However, there might be circumstances where I would be. And at that point, he kind of put his head up and thought to himself, and he said, these were his exact words, yes, I guess we're not robots. Um, so. Um, I'm not a robot, and you know, my, our daughter, who is now a, 
a legal aid lawyer in Austin, Texas, is going through the struggle about she represents lots of immigrants. At what point is she going to put her body there? Um, I don't know. Uh, Mary might be able to, to say, but I think that in some ways our kids have heard the, the resistance story a lot. And it's kind of part of, uh, part of what our, how our kids think. I don't know. Well, I think they certainly, moral issues are very important to each of them, I think. Steph, we can come back to this a little bit later, but I want to go back for a minute to um, your experience at, more about your experience at Hillel at Chicago, um, because you were, it was a very important experience for you, and you were also part of the upstairs minion there. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience meant to you? I mean, the upstairs minion is really proto Havara. It would, it might, you might say it was the beginning of, of Havara, uh, communities such as this. Um, Danny Leifer and Max Tickton uh, were dissatisfied with the Yavna Orthodox minion and wanted the minion where they could feel. Uh, that there was more intense spiritual davening, that they thought it was way too fast, um, uh, the, the speed of the davening. Um, and I think they wanted more of a community. And so they started um, uh, what was uh, first the library minion at the U University of Chicago Library, and then we went up to uh, the top floor of Hillel. Um, that, that was the upstairs minion. Um, most of the people in that minion were uh, graduate students. Um, I, I think I always felt like uh, Danny and Max, uh, I loved them both, but I think that they, the outreach to undergraduates wasn't great. Maybe they had their purpose for it. Um, there, it was the undergraduates were myself and a guy by the name of Alan Gold. Um, and uh, we would, uh, it, it began, the Minion began, I think in 65. I, I was not that active the first year, and then I became very active in it. Um, and we would, um, uh, Delvin, um, it was basically a traditional uh, nusach, except we'd, uh, we had poetry. Uh, we did not do musaf, uh, and we had a discussion, uh, a long, long discussion. A discussion based on the uh, on, on the parsha. Uh, and they would get to be very heated uh, uh, discussions. Um, and uh, the... I'm not sure exactly where the egalitarian, uh, what, the, what the lay of the land was in terms of egalitarianism. I do remember uh, that um, I was Gabi early on, and I asked Esther Tickton if she would have an aliyah, and she said no. Uh, about, uh, for historical purposes, Esther has been a real leader in the feminist movement in, uh, in the Havara movement. So I, I'm not saying this is less than horror, I'm just saying it, but this was back in 66, 67. I think she was, she was, she didn't feel comfortable with that. But I know that, uh, that we had women uh, having aliyot. Um, I can remember, I think in 68, a woman led davening, um, which to me, and I, I come from a Reconstructionist background, seemed um, odd, but but okay. Um, uh, what I do remember is that we we did play around, play around. We we had more creative davening, and uh, Danny Leifer, for me, ordered ten. Uh, Reconstructionist Sidurum, 
so that I could, when I led, I could use, I could use what was my um, nicer. Um, and um, so it was, uh, I, I, and I remember once Danny said, we need to have a service where we start off, where in part of our tefila is reading from scientific texts. So I was taking a course in biology, and uh, when it came to uh, the, the parts of the, the davening about the creation of the world, I read uh, a section from a book on entropy. Uh, uh, it, it probably was really kind of hokey, but it, I, I mean, he was calling on us to do something uh, unusual. Um, the, the learning there at Hillel um, really helped me grow. Uh, and um, I, I can remember taking a class with Max um, it must have had to do with theology because he said, Steph, I know exactly what text you have to read because this is, this is the kind of theology you have. And I was sure it would be some sort of Kaplanesque Kaplan thing. And he said, Bertrand Russell. You got to read Bertrand Russell. And uh, what a wonderful rabbi. That, what a wonderful teacher that he, that he was willing to give me over. <laughs> um, to the atheist. Uh, I was kind of taken aback by it, but I, re I read it. Um, and, and those are the kinds of uh, give and take we had. I can remember a wonderful class with Danny Leifer on Martin Buber. Um, and, uh, and what living kind of in a mythological world is like compared to a historical world. Um, it had an effect. And what, was, what, what happened through the upstairs meeting. What happened through these classes is that uh, I gave up Reconstructionism. Um, I can remember the Shabbat. Uh, there was a Shabbat where I stopped saying the, uh, before the Torah uh, reading, um, the Reconstructionists say, Asher Kavano Labo Dato, uh, who has brought us near unto thy service instead of Asher B'cha Banamiko Amim, who has chosen us from all people. And chosenness is not classical Reconstructionism. I had done, it, when I chanted the blessing through 1968, it was the Reconstructionist, and I changed. I can still remember when I changed it. Esther Tickton and Max were to my left, and Esther, nudged uh, Max and said, did you see what he's doing? <laughs> and Max went, don't, don't, don't interfere. Uh, so. And yet you said that you struggled with what you called the tribalism yeah. of the upstairs minion? Or yeah. was it No, it was, uh, again, it, I, I mean, this is who I am. There was a sense of the 67 war really it was a demarcation for me. This was because, the end of your junior year, essentially? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, the other uh, people in the Habura just <coughs> got into, uh, you know, we have to support Israel. And I mean, it's not back then, I think probably I was a bit of a Zionist, but uh, my mom was, was not much of one. And I think it influenced me a lot. And I just felt like, you know, there's this Vietnam War going on. And what are we concerned about going on in Israel? Um, uh, I remember there was this emergency meeting of Hillel people in the library. This was, yeah, it would have been June 67. And I came up, uh, I was going away for the summer to, uh, to be a consul at a camp, and I asked Max, if I could take the daily Reconstructionist prayer book with me to Delvin with that summer, but I wasn't going to be part of that group. And I never was. Um, you know, I think that the people, if, if you had asked the people in the menu, they would have thought I was very much part of it. I, I would come every week. But 
there's something more going on. I, I, I do think that my experience with uh, being involved with anti-war um, activities affected me. Um, I just, I didn't want to feel trapped in this world of just Jews. Uh, yeah, was this a time that you were also thinking about going to rabbinical school? Yeah, <laughs> it was. And, um, but I, I think that it, I think that two things come to mind. One is, is that I wanted to um, be a, uh, I, there was something about this religious search that I wanted to be part of. And second, my models for teachers, Max, and I wanted to be Max and, and, uh, um, and Danny. To this day, I, when I teach, every so often I think, how can I teach this class so I can be as good as, Dan as Max Tickton uh, as a teacher? Uh, and uh, uh, you know they were they were a model for me of what I could do. And the other thing, and uh, the third, is uh, Heschel and Martin Luther King Jr. and William Sloan Coffin. Those three, the three people that were the religious leaders at the event that Mary and I met at. Um, you know, you, a religious leader could also be doing political. Activity. At, w at what point did the two of you meet? We met going to an anti-war demonstration um, on uh, February 4th, 1967. It was a demonstration uh, of clergy and laymen against the war in Vietnam. Speak up. Uh, uh, it, it was a, uh, a demonstration against uh, the war by clergy and laymen against the war in Vietnam. We were uh, going on a bus from uh, Chicago to Washington, uh, and uh, Mary, you could tell your story about. You, you well, know, I was bus. going. I was attending a Catholic Women's College, at, and um, and uh, I was kind of a. There wasn't a huge anti-war movement at my college, but I was pretty much it with a, a couple other friends, and so we decided to go to this anti-war. Uh, conference in Washington and there was an odd number of us I think and I got on the bus last and um, so I was sitting by myself as I remember and then you came and sat down beside me and for 12 hours straight we talked we kept the whole bus up <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> at one point we were declining Latin nouns together and we were in the fourth declension and we forgot like something like the accusative singular, and somebody from the back of the bus <laughs> yelled out the answer, like, shut up, here it is. Um, I think you, um, I was struck by Mary's, um, you know, on her own, uh, going off, um, because she thought this was very important. And I was swept off my feet. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. So here we 50 are. Fifty years later. 50 the rest years. is history. Yeah. The rest is history. So let's go back to history for a minute. Um, so how would you uh, sum up your sense of self, especially Jewishly, when you graduated from college in 1968? I. I I sent you this letter that I had written to Mary, and I think that letter in some ways sums it up. And, and I mean, it, it, in some ways the letter is very embarrassing to me, but there's parts of it that I think uh, are right on, um, that I, I did not think, I still do not think, that Judaism somehow demands um, a certain, objectively, demands a certain kind of uh, uh, approach to war and peace or uh, uh, the issues of poverty. Uh, but I think that the um, 
my experience as a Jew cre created that motivation for me. And so it was like there was a, a connection between laying to fill in every day, keeping kosher, uh, uh, keeping Shabbat, and all of this other stuff that they were, um, they were all part of a package. Um, and in many ways, that was, uh, that was who I was Jewishly, but I, I, there was always this push-pull with the Jewish people. Uh, that um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure a psychoanalyst could deal with it, but that I, that I married a, uh, a, an Irish Catholic woman, uh, I mean, besides the fact that, <laughs> that she's just a wonderful person, but it was, it, it, it was something. She was something different. She was uh, outside of, of the usual cloistered Jewish world. Um, and uh, my, my very best friend uh, through now over 50 years, a black guy uh, who was a Methodist at the time, um, uh, uh, I I didn't want to just stick around Jews, um, yet it was so, I mean, I think anybody who knows me knows right off the bat that it's, it's, it's essential to my DNA. It is my DNA. So let's focus now on how you actually became involved with Chavarat Shalom. Um, how did you first become aware of the Chavarat? And the idea of creating this intentional small community in Boston. And as I said, I wanted, I was flirting with going to rabbinical school. Um, during the summer of 68, I, my dad saw an ad in the, in commentary, commentary at that time was a... Commentary magazine. Yeah, commentary magazine, it wasn't what it is now. Uh, but he, he saw an ad for the Academy for Jewish Religion. And I don't know why I, I went along with it, but he said, why did you apply there? And I came out to New York, uh, and uh, I interviewed with them. And what is the Academy of Jewish Religion? The Academy of Jewish Religion um, is a non-denominational or multi-denominational uh, uh, seminary that, that started, I think, in the 50s. Um, I think it started more for people that uh, rabbis of second careers. Um, it's still around, uh, still very, uh, 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 not necessarily robust, but it, uh, uh, it's still uh, granting smicha. Um, and I interviewed, and the, the first guy, uh, the rabbi, Rabbi, I think it was Chaim Pearl, um, interviewed me. In, you know, we never had anybody, University of Chicago graduate, uh, you know, we'd love you. The second guy had been in the military, and when he learned about my resistance, he was very negative um, and felt that I didn't have enough Jewish education, which he was right, but um, he, uh, uh, he said they'd have to put it off. So I come back to Chicago, and I... Uh, I talked with Max and Danny, and um, I, Max got really excited. He said, that we have to start teaching you Chumash and Rashi uh, so we can get you ready for it. And he recommended perhaps the seminary and that I should apply to HUC, Hebrew Union College. Um, I did apply to HUC, and at the interview I was told that I, they were not uh, admit a draft resistor, that, uh, that it would look bad for their congregations if they had a draft resistor who was going to prison, so they wouldn't accept it. What about RRC, which was just being uh, filed? Yeah, RRC had just begun, and <laughs> uh, I applied, well, I wrote to them, 
I'm not exactly sure why I gave up on it. JTS I never applied to. But Max was a good friend of Art Green. He was a very good friend of Kathy. Um, and he said, you know, there's this new community starting uh, in Cambridge. And it seemed right up my alley because this was going to create a alternative Jewish community, a model. Um, and uh, that it, I mean, in some ways it had some of the ritual aspects of the upstairs minion, but there's also the sense that it was going to be communal living. Um, uh, and uh, that there was going to be, the, how much of the social justice business, I'm not sure. Uh, I. I don't remember the way it, Max sold it to me, but it was going to be a, a creative venture. And I got excited. And so I wrote to, uh, to Art. I have a copy of the letter from Art to me um, uh, that um, I can uh, donate to the archives. Um, and then in November of uh, 1968, I went to, uh, for a Shabbos at Havarat So Havarat, the Havarat had just opened. In September. In September of that year. So this right. was two months into That's Havarat right. Shalom. And I fell in love with it. Um, I, I actually, I think I have here the service from that date, from that, um, uh, it's the Musa service, uh, Shabbat v'yishlach, uh, from that day. And uh, I mean, you look at the front page, first page of it, and there's Boober, there's Norman O'Brown. Norman O'Brown, I, nobody I think knows about Norman O'Brown these days, but um, to be open is to be broken, and to be broken is to be whole, all that kind of stuff. And then there's Leonard Cohn. Um, so uh, it was, there was poetry. The night of, that I came in the, for Kabbalah Shabbat, um, Zalman came in with his strimal and you know, this, uh, bedecked as a chassid. And, uh, and then Bert Jacobson, who was a real jewel. Uh, and I think he hasn't gotten the, uh, the play that he should have, uh, just a, a real mensch, but also a, a phenomenal davener. He davened, he did it a hodo day that I still, that night, and it's the only time I ever heard it, that I've done to this day. Actually, I once did it for, <laughs> recently, I did it for Burton, he said, who wrote that? Uh, <laughs> Can you do it? Uh, yeah. Um, Shamoza hor bedi borehad, Hishme anu elham yuhad, Adonai echad ushmo echad, Hishem otifer at veliti la, Lechad ogi likrat kala, Tene shaba ne kapala, Likrat shaba lehu venera, Ki him ko habara ha, ne rush me cat em nisu ha, so ma sever ma shavate he ila. It, uh, it builds up. It, I, I was, uh, I, I, I was taken in. And then Shabbos morning, um, they, they play music. Uh, actually, uh, I, I'm not sure if they did it that day, but they used to play uh, Misa... Misa Luba. Misa Luba was... Misa, uh, uh, Misa Coriolis or something right, like that. Right, uh, a... The, 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 the Latin, Latin American, American mass uh, they would do for Dominic. I mean, these days, I, I would think, uh, if, if I tried that at my media, they'd uh, excommunicate me. Um, it was, it, it was, uh, it, it was super daunting. And that afternoon, I was interviewed. And the people that I remember that interviewed me were Art, Art Green, Barry Holtz, Steve Zweibaum, 
Um, and I think that was it. Oh, and Michael Brooks. And um, I can still remember the first question was, you know, what do I see as my spiritual life? And I said, I, I think of it as our town in which you start off with the little community around you and then you build to the, um, uh, the larger commun Jewish community and then you build to the world. And at that point, Michael Brooks, I think it was, said, and we here in the Havara think that there's an other world and that's the world inside you. Uh, that's part, one of the circles. Um, and I then waited. Uh, it got lost in the mail, but I got a letter of acceptance. Uh, it was only at that moment point, Mary and I were already um, engaged. Mary was going to convert. And it was only at that point that I told them about Mary. Uh, I remember, I was thinking about that the other day, that. Uh, I was talking to Art on the phone about it, and he didn't bat an eye. You know, it was you know, she's going to convert. You mean at the time you were uh, talking to? Yeah, at the time she had not converted yet, but she was going to convert. I mean, she was learning with Max, and uh, I think that probably added to it. And so I came to Havarat Shalom. I graduated early from college because, uh, with the draft business. Um, I wanted to get out as I wanted to get my degree before I was out. I had actually arranged with uh, three professors that if I was going to be in prison before I graduated, they would uh, teach me long distance, uh, so I could graduate. I graduated. So did you graduate in three years? Graduated three three and a half years in uh, December 1968. And one week later, I showed up at Tavara. Wow. Okay, let's let's switch mm -hmm. gears for a minute. Let's turn to Mary. Um, uh, and you were born in 1948 mm -hmm. in Chicago to a religious Catholic family. That's right. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your family when you were growing up? Um, well, I was a middle child, uh, the third child of six children uh, in, in a good Catholic family. Um, and um, I grew up on the northwest side of Chicago, and very, Chicago's very ethnically segregated city. Um, and my parents were very devout Catholics, and we were always very much a part of whatever parish we were in, and um, we went to Catholic schools. My father was a tool and die maker. My mother um, was a homemaker. She had gone to teacher's college. She was um, the only, the only uh, student from her high school uh, when she told her teachers that she was going to go to teacher's college that she was the only student from her high school that had gone on to college, um, which she did. Um, uh, but, you know, they struggled. They, you know, they, they, they kind of lived from paycheck to paycheck, but it was very important for them to send us to Catholic schools, and they managed to come up with the money to do it. Um, what was the neighborhood like where you lived? Um, it was a, mostly a Polish neighborhood, I'd say, uh, that was predominant ethnic uh, component, but there were, you know, non-Polish people as well, obviously. Predominantly Catholic? Pred um, yeah, there were, yeah, Catholics would, I would say, um, yeah, there were a lot of Catholics, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have known, I mean, in the circles I traveled, I wouldn't have known the non-Catholics, quite honestly, because everything was kind of Catholic-centric in my world. Yeah. Um, How would you describe the environment in your home and the role of Catholicism and, and, and your local parish in, in shaping your family's life when you were a child? Well, I think that my parents, my mother was a convert to Catholicism, basically, because she had, her mother was Catholic, but her mother was an invalid for most of her life, and so with raising her fell really to her father, who was not Catholic, but he had promised the priest that she'd be raised as a Catholic. So even though I don't think, you know, there wasn't any 
Catholicism in her life. Um, at one point when she wanted to become Lutheran because she was hanging out with some kids who were Lutheran and going to their youth activities, her father said, no, I promised your mother when I married her that you would be Catholic, so no, you can't. But, um, but she, was, she was kind of a seeker. I think she was a very spiritual person, and um, she really embraced Catholicism. Um, it was very, very important to her. Um, her spiritual life was very important to her. You said your parents really led by example. Yeah, teaching. no, they didn't really talk about it much. I mean, they, they went to church every week, and they, um, you know, we had, I remember before Christmas, we would have an ad, my father would make an Advent wreath, and we would have, um, you know, prayers after every, after, after, after dinner, short prayers every week, re leading, every day leading up to Christmas. I mean, there was a spiritual sense, but they really didn't talk about it much, you know, about like, we should do this because this is what God wants. You know, there was not, you know, nothing, nothing like that. I mean, my father was, I think I, I mentioned to you in my, perhaps in the uh, information I sent you before the interview that uh, my father, for whatever reason, was really concerned with social justice. Um, and he never talked about it, but um, he would, he would, he would work six days a week because um, he always needed the overtime. Um, so it was really a big deal for him when, like on Christmas Eve, his, uh, the factory he worked in would shut down for the afternoon. So he would actually have an afternoon off, but he would spend it uh, delivering um, Christmas baskets for a settlement house on Chicago's west side. And he would make sure that to bring a couple of us down to kind of help uh, carry the, the food in or whatever. And it was really because he wanted us to see um, and I think at one point he may have even said to me, you know, that, you know, not everybody has what you have. Um, I, I, there was a didactic, a subtle didactic <laughs> purpose there. Um, and, um, and then in the, when I was a teenager, um, it was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the, it was the height of the civil rights movement, I guess. And um, he never talked about it much, but he and my mother joined a, um, a local, the local Human Relations Council, and um, there would be picnic activities with all these white families from Norwood Park and some black families from who knows where, and you know we would have a picnic together, and um, um, and you know, I didn't really even realize he talked about it so little that I didn't realize until um, after he, when he passed away, people were talking about uh, things they remembered about him. And one brother said, "Yeah, I remember we used to get beat up after those picnics by the local kids." And another somebody else remembered, "Yeah, Dad put a support open housing bumper sticker on our car," and that was not something that he was probably one of the only people in Norwood Park with that sticker on his car. Um, but he just thought it was the right thing to do, so he was going to do it. He was, you know, he was, um, he was very uh, concerned about doing what he thought was right. How did you personally feel about Catholicism as you grew into your adolescence? Oh, well, you know, I guess if, if, if there had been Reconstructionism and Catholicism, <laughs> I guess I would have been a Reconstructionist for a while, and then I just, and then I just said, I just can't relate to this in any way. I just couldn't. Um, what was it? About um, it I think that it's that well. I think that that the the schools that I went to were not were not um, staffed by by teachers who were very um, sensitive to religious struggle, or they had kind of a, a very emotional relationship to Catholicism and, and um, a kind of uh, a very literalist way of looking at things. Um, and I, you know, so, you know, when I was an adolescent and I, you know, you know, I just, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't think that this can be right. And I, you know, I basically, you know, I would, you know, I didn't want to argue with my parents, so I would just, um, leave for church just sensibly and go to the local laundromat and read a book till it was time to go home, you know, I just, um, you know, I just, I just, 
you know, I, I couldn't relate to the theology and I couldn't in the hierarchy and the, um, and I don't think I had much respect for the teachers that I had or the, the religious people I saw around me, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any exposure to Judaism or to Jews? Oh, no, not at all. Not in Norwood Park. I don't think there were any Jews in Norwood Park. <laughs> I doubt it. I think the first Jewish person I met was when I was working over the summer um, at, a, you know, at a job, maybe when I was in college. There was a woman who was Jewish who worked there. I think that was like, you know, I, I mean, Jews, my God, I didn't even know any Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt very smothered, too, because I was, I was very intellectually... Um, just very interested and curious about things and, um, and so I really read a lot and um, I felt very smothered I think and I did not want to go to a Catholic college I wanted to go downstate to the local University of Illinois I didn't want to go to a Catholic college I just I wanted something to see the big there was a big world out there I wanted to see it and experience it but my father at that point um, you know, was enough of a traditionalist to say, no, you have to go to a Catholic college, you know, unless you're prepared to move out and live on your own, which I wasn't. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, you know, I did well on all the tests and I got a scholarship to a woman's college in um, Chicago, which fortunately for me was staffed by uh, a religious order called the BVM, the Blessed Virgin, Sisters of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which was, I think, I don't know if it was an Irish order, but it was a very... It attracted people who were very smart, and and there was a value for education of education, and um, the teachers were very well qualified. I mean, obviously, it wasn't just religious teachers; there were, you know, other teachers in the school. Um, but um, but they were, you know, these were the these were the kind of people who were you know, really embraced Vatican II and um, uh, were wonderful teachers, and I, you know. Had you been affected by Vatican II and your family, for that matter? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't. I don't remember. Um, I, I mean, I guess I was sort of aware of it distantly, but it didn't really seep down to the parish level much. I mean, maybe the priest faced the uh, faced the changed the altar around, like if. If the cardinal said, change the altar around and face the uh, congregation instead of having your back to it during the service, you know, it's very hierarchical. They would have done it, I'm sure, but it, it, didn't, um, it didn't feel like there was a sea change. I mean, I think in college, it did very much affect probably the, my teachers in college. Um, yeah, there was an openness and some wonderful people. I mean, they had this chapter of clergy and laymen concerned about the war. They, you know, there were. Uh, that's how I learned about it, I think, because they had this. You know, the the, the teachers. Some of the teachers were involved in that. So again, this was a very eventful period in. American oh yes, history. it was. It to was. To what extent within your Catholic college environment were you aware of? The counterculture to what it's oh, yeah. affecting you personally. Well, you know, I think that I was, I read, I mean, like part of my adolescent reading was reading this, I mean, Vietnam, everyone was talking about Vietnam, so I read Bernard Fall and, you know, all the books and, and it changed the way I looked at things, which was very hard for my father to understand because he was a World War II veteran and, you know, it, um, but, uh, you know, I was like, I was, uh, yeah, it was uh, very significant for me and, um, and most of the people that I went to college with, um, the people that I hung out with most were people who were uh, um, not very much involved, not involved really in politics and pretty conservative, I guess, in general. But there were people at the college who weren't. And so I, you know, I, I organized a teach-in and I organized some little marches around. And, were you influenced, um, for instance, by um, the Berrigans? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I mean, I knew who they were. Yeah, 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 I mean, the leadership, yeah, I was, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, yeah, there was real leadership on the part of Catholics in that movement. Right. But you're saying it didn't really seep too much into 
the environment in your women's college in Chicago? Um, yeah, well, we were kind of, I think, like, things were changing, roles were changing for women at the more um, kind of elite colleges, I think. Like, I think women at U of C were thinking about what kind of career will I have. Well, in my college, I don't think too many people were thinking about what kind of career other than the traditional careers um, for women. Um, what were you thinking about in terms of career? I don't know. I had a very, I, I think, um, maybe blue collar attitude, I, but but kind of with a twist because my mother, I think both my parents prized education, um, and I always thought I'd go to college, but I never thought, I never thought about having a job that would be a career. I thought about well, I'd have to have a job. I mean, I, I think in that world, maybe coming out of that world, um, a job is what you have to do to live. It's not, you don't think of it in terms of what will satisfy me, what will make me happy, what will, I mean, that doesn't come into it was in that, that world. Is that true for the boys in your family? Yeah, I don't think that they, well, except for my brother, who I have a younger brother who went to law school right out of college. And I think his experience, he went to his high school, the high kind of high school, he went to a better high school, a uh, high school where, uh, uh, and it was more, it was in a suburban area, He w and it was really more, um, I think maybe he had a different frame of mind leaving high school, and he went away to college, the rest of us didn't, the rest of us stayed in Chicago. And so he just had a very different experience, and he went, I mean, I think he did think in those terms. Yeah. So where were you in your college career when you and Steph met? Um, I was a sophomore, so I was in my second year of college. And you had planned and to I, go to France, right? Right. I was going to go. I was a French major. I was going to go to France because I looked at college as well. You know, this is like I can learn what I want to learn. I can s take things that are interesting to me. I can. It's sort of my chance to explore things, and whatever. I, and I really didn't think about what happens beyond that. I really, I just didn't think. Well, then I guess I'll get a job. You know. And I didn't want to be a teacher at the time, so I didn't take education classes. And I didn't, you know, so I just took what I wanted to take, and, and then I would figure out what to do yeah. the next step. I, mean, I really didn't think beyond college. Sounds like you were pretty smitten. Well, I was. <laughs> I was. <laughs> you should tell about what your father said, though, when you told him about meeting me. Yeah, when I started dating stuff, my father said, you know, if you get serious, he's going to want you to become Jewish. And I said, oh no, he would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> so when did that become something that you were actually thinking about? And what was the process by which you decided to convert? Well, you know, stuff had, when we talked about getting married, stuff had talked about how it was important to him to have a Jewish house. And that it was important to him. It was important to him that that his wife be Jewish, and that was kind of shocking to me, because I, I really hadn't thought of myself as Catholic, um, but I also hadn't thought of myself as Jewish, and I said I don't know. I have to think about it, and so I started to study with Max, and he gave me at the University of Chicago, and he gave me a list of books to read, and I read about it, and I think I'd taken. There was one uh, class I'd taken at my college. They had the, a local rabbi um, teach a class in Judaism. So I knew a little something. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and after studying, I kind of felt that it was a step that I could take. You want to tell about the James Joyce paper? Oh, yeah, I guess I did have this interest. Yeah, I, I just, I, in one of my classes, we read Ulysses by James Joyce. And so the topic I chose to write my paper on was, you know, uh, Leopold Bloom is, a, you know, a Jewish character in this. This was before meeting Before you. I met you. So I guess I had some interest, but um, uh, it was interesting, you know. <laughs> but it's different than becoming Jewish, you know. Was there a turning point for you, a moment or an experience that sort of, Flipped it for you, where you could not only consider it, but were actively pursuing conversion. You know, I really don't think. I think that it was all very new to me, and I don't think that I really felt Jewish till I'd been, until I'd been living 
as a Jew for a few years because it's, it was very, very new, very different. When, when and, and how did you actually become a convert? Um, I studied with Max for um, about a year, I guess, right? And you would go to and Shabbos. I, and I would go to Shabbos. He was wonderful. He invited me down to Hyde Park to spend Shabbos with his family. And, um, you know, everything that I learned was very, um, about it was very uh, positive and very warm. And the Havara, I would go out to visit Steph at some point, was out in Boston with the Havara, and I would go out periodically and see him. And, you know, while I was there, we would, you know, go to Shabbos there and whatever. And everybody was very welcoming, and it seemed very warm and uh, wonderful. So what point did you I had a very positive, I mean, I thought, I mean, I guess for Jews who were born as Jews, the Havara was something very different. But to me, this was sort of normative Judaism at first, because <laughs> it's, it's how I uh, experienced Judaism was through Max and through, I mean, I mean, I guess I had gone to a couple different regular synagogue services, but to me, that's what was normative Judaism was more the Havara. We married on December 20th, 1969, Mary converted Thanksgiving of 69. So just before. Yeah. So Steph had become a member of the Havara in December of 69, 68. And when did you first start coming? And do you have any memories of I think your early experience? Well, I think I went out to visit you on, on, like I remember being there once in June for, and we, there was a retreat, a Shavuot uh, uh, retreat, I think. Was it Shavuot? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so this is We'd come out, I come out periodically yeah. and Six. see him. Yeah. And then uh, in the anti-war demonstration, November 15, oh, right. 1969. Yeah. Uh, in D.C. In D.C., a number of people in the Habara came down. I think it was very important for them. Uh, and uh, Mary came from Chicago. And it was kind of a bra... A, uh, a great B movie moment because she was at one end of the table and I was at the other end and we <laughs> ran to each other in front of the whole Havara <laughs> and embraced. Yeah. Um, but that, that was something we did together. Right, the anti-war demonstrations. Yeah, whenever there'd be a big one, we'd be there. Um, yeah. And then you came, well, the wedding was really, you came about a, a week before the wedding, right? Right, yeah. You came in the sense that in the you, moved, you moved to yeah, Boston? Yeah, to yeah, Cambridge? yeah, because I think my classes, I, I was, I finished, I finished college early. I took a heavy load and I went over the summer, I guess. So I finished college early and then we got in December. It was a trimester. So we finished in December and then we came out and we were married December 20th. So right we after. We came out right after, yeah. Right, right after. So. Your wedding was the first wedding at the Havara. At the Havara. Yeah. Can you describe it and how it came to be, and what it was like? I think we talked about it with Art right beforehand, a couple we of days. We went to the Boston Public Library, to the wonderful Jewish Judaic section, and we got uh, books on uh, customs for weddings. And we... Um, I think from that book we got the idea of the kittle, um, a way kittle of your walking around these seven times, um, of having two, not a kind of a uh, a best man and a bridesmaid, but having two people carrying candles next to you. Uh, so this was all from a book, uh, from books. Um, you did go to Eddie and Merle. Feld's wedding right, in right. June. Right, that's right, yeah. Um, was that your first Jewish wedding? That was my first Jewish wedding, and my, I think my own was my second. <laughs> <laughs> and then we met with uh, the rabbis that married us uh, under the chuppah were Max and Art, um, and uh, we met with them. It was just a few days before the wedding. Yeah, I remember we kind of talked about it, like, for, for Where like, a little bit. Where did the wedding take place? It took a, a place at Habarat Shalom, 
uh, at in the in Cambridge. I, no the sum uh, because oh, the already it had minutes. moved from Cambridge to Somerville it was in uh, where it is now uh, and uh, uh, the the Havarad did it for us I mean it's uh, uh, we had no money uh, I can remember we had what seventy five dollars for I think flowers. I had sixty yeah yeah. Yeah, that's all we had. We didn't have any money. Um, and they, uh, everybody made food for us. The people in Dorton uh, made the curtains. The, w the people in Dorton, the women in Dorton made the curtains. Uh, the, uh, the curtains for what? For the curtains for the, the, the building. The, the Havarat Shalom did not have curtains at the time, uh, out of the windows. So I guess because. <laughs> Uh, older people were coming, grown-ups were coming, we were going to have uh, curtains. Um, was the w where did the wedding take place? It took place in the main room. I don't know if they still dove in there, but it's uh, in the first Jewish catalog. There's a room with pillows. That's where we got married. Uh, Everett Gendler brought in a, um, a candelabra with real candles that we hung in that room. It was all done by candlelight. Um, and we had, um, each of us had two people. Uh, you had your sister and, and, Joanne. and Joanne carrying candles. And I had my brother and my friend Howard with candles uh, under the hoopah. Um, what were you wearing? I had, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I had a white dress. My mother. My mother uh, sewed, so she made me a dress. And I didn't want a veil, but she, she said, oh, you should have a veil. So she made me a little veil, so I wore it. And uh, The ketubah was... What did you wear? Oh, I wore a blue suit. I still have the tie, a Sagittarian tie, uh, and my kittle, uh, which I still have, and I still wear at Yom Kippur and the Pesach. Um, I, there was a big debate, I remember, with Max on about the Kittle. He, I wanted to have a reading from Rosenzweig on how the Kittle was like a uh, putting your fist up to God. That it was saying, I'm going to die, but I'm going to have, I'm going to enjoy myself uh, before I die. And Max, I don't think, liked that very much. And he, he had the suggestion of wearing a coat and then taking it off with the kittle. But I wore the kittle. Um, and was there anything else we had a debate about? The two rings. You wanted two rings. Two rings. Yeah. I didn't because it wasn't traditional. Um, I, we mm -hmm. had quite a, mm -hmm. a little battle over that one. Um, Do you remember what, what you said? Did you say what form you, you used the traditional formulation? I'm sure. Hareyat Mekudesh at least. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you? What did you say? Do you not remember? I don't remember. You said nothing. I said nothing. I, was, was I guess that's why I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, but, and there was no discussion of, of me walking around her. I mean, I. I for us, we were reading some anthropologist. It was like she was giving her um, her genitalia to me. Uh, so that's <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, really, egalitarianism was was quite a ways away. I think for the Havara and for you know, like in my background, I think it really hadn't hit the college I was at very much. But Mary's folks came in, which I think was something. Uh, and my mom and dad did. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if it's that important for this story, but it's a bit, it, it's for this history, but it's a great story that uh, after the wedding, at, during the meal, uh, my mom said to Mary's mom, uh, this must be very difficult for you with her converting. Um, and then my mom said, um, that, you know, maybe one of my children will convert to Catholicism and then we'll be equal. <laughs> it was so much my mother tried to be really sweet and just not being. 
um, the night that we got married on a Saturday night, um, and we had a Shabbos dinner at my uh, that was my apartment. It was became our apartment. Um, uh, I was totally in white. That was the thing. You, uh, that our That's right. You used to have that white shirt you would wear for Shabbos Actually, with embroidery, you like on, a, on the front, it was like a Mexican sort of. That was peasant later. It was just look. But that night, it was just yeah. white shirt, white pants, uh, and Mary's folks came over, and at one point, you heard. My father say to your father, you know, the price of uh, kosher chickens in Buffalo <laughs> have been going down. As if Jim Keller <laughs> would be interested in that. <laughs> My father had a, a very polite but puzzled look on his face. <laughs> I think it was really kind of culturally overwhelming for my parents. But there was a feeling at that wedding. I, I, I don't know if anybody would t tell you this too, but it was, um, it, it really was a community that, it was actually a time when the Dorton people and the non-Dorton people really came together. It was a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful dancing. Uh, the floor of the Havara uh, supposedly was about ready to crash down. They stopped the dancing because I guess arts and some people went downstairs and saw it. It was going to fall down. The musicians were all just people, uh, one of my friends, and then people in the Havara. Um, uh, I think your folks, we, we have a picture with all non-Jewish people uh, uh, dancing uh, of your, mm -hmm. um, your family. Sounds like it was a very significant event in the life of the Chavara, the beginnings of the Chavara, many people have mentioned it actually as a significant event. Yeah, um, art was just, art was the consummate congregational rabbi. You know, and I think, uh, you know, if, if he sees this, I don't mean this at all, art as a, a put down, I think it's a, re it's a real credit to, you know, to, to this, you know, brilliant teacher, but that at that moment, my sister wasn't, didn't get there on time, and my father was just going nuts with it, and Art just talked to him and talked him down in such a sweet way, calming everything down. He was really playing the role of getting us all together. And he was very kind to my parents, too. He did his best to make what was a very uncomfortable situation for them uncomfortable. He really, he really, uh, uh, tried to make them feel feel good. Right. So let's delve into some of the key uh, components of the Chavara, but both in terms of the expressed ideal, but also in terms of the lived experience for members of the community. Many people point to community as the essence, the heart of what the Chavara endeavor was about. Steph, you were um, you became a member just a month or two after after the Havara began. How would you describe the community at that point in terms of who was there, what kinds of backgrounds they were bringing? It was the whole spectrum. I mean, you had uh, people like Steve Zweibob who uh, were uh, not he was from a, a family of Holocaust survivors, but did not have much of a knowledge background, and I, I really don't believe much of a, uh, of an uh, observance of the background before he came. Uh, and then you had people like Joey, who had grown up in Queens in, a, in an observant household. Uh, Barry, Barry Holt, who was from a, uh, a, a strong conservative background of KI in, in Brookline, and Joe Lukitsky had had a big effect on his development. Uh, uh, you had uh, and then, uh, Art, whose uh, 
who daily was on a journey of uh, where to go spiritually. Uh, uh, my, while I, my, I think I was very observant, uh, my, uh, my language skills were abysmal. Uh, uh, I never really had, I had been a taken Hebrew school, but I really did, could tackle with tech, text very well. Uh, they actually asked well, what what I was supposed to do was to be, since this was a seminary, it was Havarat Shalom Community Seminary, uh, I was supposed to, uh, supposed to, I was required to take a Hebrew course and I, uh, uh, tutoring, and I was tutored once a week uh, by someone uh, in Cambridge uh, using Moshe Greenberg's uh, uh, Hebrew book. Uh, so there was this, uh, this spectrum of observance, a spectrum of knowledge, uh, where we would uh, kind of come together would be <laughs> three things jump out. One is, is there'd be a communal meal once a week. Uh, and we had these tables that uh, Zalman had uh, come up with the idea of, which had both long legs and short legs, so that when we had our, our meals, we put the short legs on them and we'd sit on pillows around the, the tables and we'd eat. And that was once a week, and it was a, 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 a very warm feeling. Uh, and then Shabbos morning, uh, and uh, uh, the third was meetings. Uh, and I think that uh, it was kind of the antithesis of the, uh, of the, uh, of the meals in that uh, they would go on for a long, long time. Uh, I, I never was at a kibbutz meeting, but uh, I think it may have had some of the uh, uh, the initia of that, that uh, um, there'd be contentious issues, especially when it came to whether or not to admit new people. I mean, the, the Havara was a closed community. People could come for Shabbos morning, uh, they could come for uh, like Tu Bishvat Seder, but uh, to be part of the community, you had to be voted in. And those were contentious. Uh, contentious because h how did it work in terms of who would get, I mean, what did it take for someone not to be admitted? Well, oh, it, it was very, uh, there were people that were not admitted, and uh, it was, uh, I mean, honestly, I think uh, probably like a fraternity. Uh, that it was very much. There was this one guy, and she he, he showed up in the pictures at the wedding, uh, who uh, 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 he he interviewed. Everybody was really up for him, and then he went, I think, to a retreat with us. Uh, he he got on people's nerves uh, a lot, and that was it. Uh, we did not uh, accept the, the guy. Uh, and then in, uh, this was in March of 69, so this was before we were married, there was a major decision to be made on whether to expand the membership of the Havara or keep it small. And I was in the keep it small category because I thought that uh, there were, I came, in my vision was that this should be some sort of alternative community and I mean it, it we, 
I think we talked about income sharing. I think we talked about joint child rearing. We had no children. We had no income. So it was all very theoretical. Uh, but there was a sense that we would we would be very much part of our uh, uh, each other's lives in a uh, in a communal sense o over a long period of time. Over a long period of time, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, while it was a seminary, it was also going to be a community that we w we would stick together. Uh, you know, it, it it's odd at that time. You didn't think, <laughs> at least I didn't think about you know what was I going to do ten years from now. Uh, I mean, there is a there is a sense. David Roskies and I have talked about this that this was a utopian adventure, uh, that we were going to change things in a revolutionary way, not not politically uh, for most of them, but it was uh, this wasn't going to be just the usual Jewish community. So, what, what was the ideal notion of community to the extent that you can articulate it? It's it's all over the place. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but I, I don't know if you've seen these, but the, uh, in, uh, in, seven, in the early 1970s, there were these position papers that people wrote. Have you seen them? We haven't seen them, but I've, we've, many people have mentioned uh, them. Right okay, I have them. Uh, I'm sure lots of people in the Havara have them on the lock and key. Uh, and it... It goes, it's the gamut. Uh, there were people like me that... Okay, go back and say, okay. where did, why were there position papers? Where did that okay. come from? In many ways, uh, where we would be going as a community was where art thought that we should be, that, that, that we were at a turning point, a pivotal point. And sometime, this was after our wedding, uh, but in early uh, uh, 70, and this has to do, I think, with Dorton and with the push for communal living by some people, that, you know, what should we be? And so Art, uh, I believe it was Art, said that we should be uh, writing position papers and having basically parlor meetings at his house to discuss where we should be going. So at, at his house and not at the Chavarot? Now that's interesting, yes. At least that the one that I went to was at his apartment. It was not at the Chavarot. Well, well, that seems symbolically important. Somehow. I have no idea why. I mean, maybe, maybe it was just the night that I, that I went to one, but I think that most of them took place there. It was, it was, so much that art was convening it, uh, that this was part of, of, in many ways it was a struggle of, of, of where he wanted to go. Uh, I mean, he once told me that uh, one of the big influences uh, for the Havara was Dad Berrigan, and he met with Dad and Dad Berrigan said, why don't you have a Catholic workers' movement in Judaism like we do in Catholicism? So this is the, the meeting that took place in Heschel's seminar? I believe so. JTS. I believe so. Yeah. And that was a big influence. And I, I think at my first interview, he said something like, we would like you because you're someone who could be uh, involved in more political activity. Uh, Jim Kugel, who had already was a member, was a head of the Jewish uh, Peace Fellowship in Boston. He was a conscientious objector at the time. He later became a resistor. Uh, uh, Jim was involved with, uh, with anti-war activities and with draft counseling, but most people were not. Uh, and, uh, so there was that part of uh, art's vision that I, that I, I like. The other part, and I think it's a part I know very little about, 
but it, it was a, a spiritual quest and the use of drugs in that spiritual quest. Uh, and uh, I never was, and I, and I don't say this kind of in a, a puritanical way, it was just something I wasn't that interested in. Uh, uh, but uh, the use of psychedelic drugs to, in terms of, uh, of the spiritual adventure, and, and, and that, going back to my initial interview, that internal uh, sense of, uh, of quest, I think, was part of the community vision. Uh, and then you add to that when the Dorton people were admitted and became part of it, uh, uh, the Dorton people very much wanted to have uh, uh, the communal living together and support. Uh, so you had these three. Uh, I think we need to talk for a minute about the beginnings of Dorton <coughs> because you okay. mentioned it several times and okay. we need to discuss when did Dorton start to form and that was it? That meeting in March of 1969. Uh, so the, the big struggle was we were going to get a lot of people, uh, accept a lot of people, or we were going to stay small. And at small at the time was how about many people? 20, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, I could go through the names, but I think it was about 20 people. And there were maybe a little less. And we were talking about. I don't know if it was doubling, but it was, it was adding a lot of people. And uh, I had done my own lobbying. Uh, uh, I remember that uh, I thought Joey Reber was with me to vote for it, and, and Art had talked to Joey, uh, and I felt, uh, I felt betrayed. Uh, and, uh, uh, I was alone. Uh, when it came to the vote, uh, a number of the people voted, uh, recu uh, recused themselves, didn't vote because they were leaving. Uh, uh, Eddie was leaving. Already? This was at the end of the... Eddie was going to leave. Eddie left to become Hill director at Champagne in 69. This is at the end of the first year. Yes. He's not even quite the end. That's right. Zalbud was leaving. Uh, uh, Buzzy, I believe Buzzy left. I'm almost sure Buzzy left. Uh, Buzzy and Moto left after the first year. So uh, there were people that were going to be leaving, and the idea that Art had at that March '69 meeting was that we were going to be a big tent, and we'd have some of the communal people, and we'd have some of the the. Uh, e Either the, yeah, I, I would think you would say that I'll call it the spiritual quest people. What, what, what did communal people mean? Communal people meant people, uh, and these are the people that ended up in Norton, uh, Steve and Sue Gendon, Gendon uh, uh, Jeff and Terry Sokol, uh, Kathleen Martindale, and uh, Charles Cote. Was there anybody else? Yeah, they were the ones that lived at Norton. Right. And so they were gonna. They wanted. They wanted to. Get, none of them had very good uh, uh, Jewish knowledge or background, but they were. They wanted to live communally and to establish uh, uh, a Jewish communal home. Uh, then the people. Uh, there were people that were, what I'll call more mainstream. Uh, uh, People that wanted to get graduate degrees, some of them wanted to have divinity deferments. Uh, Jim Sleeper, uh, uh, Steve Mitchell, uh, 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 Hillel Levine, and uh, George Saverin, Richie Siegel, uh, and uh, they had. They were there part-time because they were graduate students. They were graduate students. And that was what, from the time that I got there, I was, uh, I was concerned about it. That 
uh, I'm not going to question their their motives because they think everyone wanted to be part of a community. But it was a way of being in graduate school and having a divinity to firm it with some with some folks. Uh, and uh, uh, so at that meeting, it was decided that uh, we were going to take all these people. I left the meeting halfway. I, this is a whole other story that really isn't important to this history. I went, I just got on a Greyhound bus and went to Bangor, Maine uh, to, to have my own period to process what had happened. I was very upset by, by what had happened. Because? Because I wanted, I wanted this to be, uh, I thought that with a lot of people that it would, uh, that it would be uh, a nice little group, uh, a nice little community, but not a community that was seeking to bring about change. Actually, David Roski's was accepted. Uh, was what? Was one of the people accepted as well. Uh, it was it, kind of this variety of people that were that were certainly concerned about uh, about alternative Jewish thought, uh, but whether to change the the way that we would live uh, as families, as a community, or uh, the way that we would have an effect politically uh, was, uh, was not that important to these folks. Well, also, I, I mean, as I recall, you were, one of your concerns was that you came expecting a, to get Smicha to get, a, that the full-time focus would be on Jewish texts leading to some kind of Smicha, right? And that, that, that wasn't, that as people were in, if people were in graduate programs, that wouldn't be the focus? I don't know. That it was was that a, one of the, the issues of for you? The seminary sort of starting to that, was that, that was, yes, it was that, Yes, it began to fall away. Oh, okay. I think it was some of it, but I, I, maybe I, uh, I'm not remembering all, but there was, a, there was a sense that this was not going to be, this is going to be basically uh, a, a nice uh, uh, community for governing, but nothing more. There was not going to be any impact. I want to ask you about the, the idea of the Brit, the, 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 the covenant that, well, tell us, tell us where that came from and what happened with it. Okay. Sometime at a retreat, and this was very early on, it could have been it could have been in December 68. Uh, at a Hanukkah retreat, I met late on a, uh, it was a Friday night, with R, and I said, this isn't what I, <laughs> this wasn't what I signed up for, but I wanted something more intense. And he was, he, he responded by saying that he was very excited about it, and that he agreed with it, uh, and that he would draw something up. I, uh, I, I felt quite good. Now, uh, you know, the, I had just come, so it was kind of odd that, that I would, that this was happening, but I, 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 I felt at that time let down. Uh, so early on. So early on. Uh, that, I mean, this could, this is probably a lot of my own Michigas, but, uh, uh, you know, that, I, that I'm probably never happy with anything, but uh, it, it, it was early. Uh, and uh, he then drafted, uh, which you probably have, uh, uh, the breed. And we were going to have a meeting to discuss the breed. And this, I think, was, in, this was before the meeting in March, and it was probably February of 69. Uh, and uh, 
I think what says a lot about my relationship with the Havara, I don't remember talking to many people about it or people wanting to talk to me about it. About uh, the Brit? About the Brit. But I don't, I don't it, I, actually, I don't even think it had been distributed yet, but the whole concept of Brit, I think, was in the air. Uh, and there was going to be a meeting uh, uh, on, on a morning, probably February, sometime in February 69, uh, and Art was going to run the meeting. At the morning of the meeting, I get there, and Art is leaving. He's been called a jury duty, and he's not going to be there for it, and he wants me to leave the meeting. Uh, and uh, I should have been smart enough at the time to know this was not going to happen. Uh, and what, what, why not? What do you mean? I, here I am, this young guy who's just come into the the uh, to the Havara now. At that time, I, I boy, I, I ju just was there. What we had is six month coordinators who would coordinate just the logistics for the minion, and I was asked to do that right off the bat. I don't think it's like the junior member of the Supreme Court being asked to vote mm -hmm. first. I think it was that there's a lot of respect for the ideas I was bringing in. So I was, I was already in a in some sort of leadership role. But people really didn't know me well. And a lot of these people were five, six years older than I was uh, and were, were already married and uh, had uh, professional professions that they were going into. Uh, and uh, the, the media was a disaster. I remember, I, I actually, I asked that we read it aloud the breed. The breed allowed to begin with. I remember asking Eddie, and Eddie refused. And then I asked Buzzy, and Buzzy refused. I, I could still see myself <laughs> sitting on the floor at this, and it, there was this wall that we weren't going to be involved with this. And what people said, and I think that this was genuine as could be, that they weren't signing up for this kind of intensity that you know, it was, they wanted to be able to decide, they wanted the community, they, they wanted to feel uh, a certain intimacy, uh, but they didn't want to feel that close. I, and the idea in the Brit was that there would be people that would be, have the Brit hanging in their houses uh, that uh, to show their commitment. That this was modeled on, there were, there were precedents for this in yeah. Jewish history, historical precedents. Right. And that was part of, you know, this was going to be a very, uh, a side of a, of a commitment of these people together. But there were, could be other people in the Chabura that were not part of the So group. it wasn't obligatory that one signed this. No, but but my idea, at any rate. right. But my memory is, is that there were a lot of voices saying no. Now there may have been voices. There may have been voices for it, but I don't think they were there were strong voices. Was this the first time people were seeing the bridge, or had it been circulated? I don't think it had been circulated. Uh, I'm almost certain it had it been, although. Although I must, art must have shown it to me, so I I can't be sure. Uh, uh, but I think that there would have been more. There would have been more discussion of it before it happened. It, I think people had a, a sense of of where art was going. Uh, I, 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 I certainly felt let down by Art. Uh, let down by Art in what way? That somehow he could have gotten out of jury duty that day, or at least told me about what was going on, or maybe put it off to another day. He, I think, might have been able to have get it accepted. 
Uh, or, yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt he could have. Uh, and I think what happened, in, it was probably a month later with this meeting, is that he had, uh, well, I should be talking for him, as the sense I got was that he had decided that it would be better for the, for the, for the community to have different, uh, different subgroups that would, uh, you know, some that were more intense and that some were not. Uh, and so we, we then accepted a large number of people. So the, what was the ending of this meeting about the breach? Uh, the end of the meeting that we were going to do it. It was an, a rejection of it. Yes, there was a rejection of it. And, you know, it's odd. I must have talked to Art about it. I have no memory of, of it. Uh, it was, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a document that historically I think is important for the Havara, but I think it's important because it was not accepted. Uh, the, the, now, whether, if it would have been accepted, what would have happened, I have no idea. Uh, but we were, uh, I mean, there were some people, uh, Noam Kornfeld, who was, uh, Alef Sholem, who was at Chicago when I was at Chicago and Max had gotten there. I think he wanted something more intense. Uh, I think that Jim Kugel did. Uh, did you have a model? Did these people have a model in your mind that all it would seem were out there? Monasteries, various other models of small intentional communities. I think communities. I think Art did, and I, as Kathy certainly did. Uh, Kathy was very interested in monastic communities. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, if I, if I was to think of anything, it was the, the communes that I knew about uh, in Chicago. Uh, uh, certain somebody, certainly some of the people in Dorton had it. Uh, the communes in California, uh, Terry and, and Jeff probably did. Uh, but it, it was more modern. There was, we didn't go back to... Yeah, uh, at least in my head, I didn't go back to traditional models. So in the aftermath of that meeting, what happened? We, we accepted all the people. I was considering leaving the Havara. Uh, so then there were around 40 people were that's right. the number. That's right. Going this, into the second year. Going into the second year. We had this, I think you came to this retreat, I'm not sure. We had a retreat at the uh, religious center. Packard Mance. Packard Mance. Yeah, good. Uh, in June. Yeah, I think I did. I think I was there for that. Yeah, and um, we, we, we had lots of different uh, learning sessions. And then there was one night that uh, was given over to social action. Uh, and that night, uh, I don't know why we did it this way, but Art said that we were going to eat, like in a monastery, in silence. <laughs> For social action, I'm not exactly sure what it was about, but that was it. And that's, that's what we did. And then after it, we went out, and I had this idea that we needed a social action project. And that project was going to be a drop-in center for high school kids who are unaffiliated uh, Jews, well, just and any teenagers in Brookline, Massachusetts. Why Brookline? I think it was because it had a, uh, a large Jewish community and there were kids that were searching for things. Yeah, I'm not sure if it had much to do with uh, that there were contexts in Brookline, but actually, uh, in many ways, at least in its original 
for idea of it, it was connecting with expertise that people had because we were going to do uh, a meditation workshop, a candle making workshop, uh, 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 draft counseling. It was uh, the idea that I had was that this is a way that we could have people at uh, uh, in the Habura be involved with something outside the Habura. And were people in the Habura actually teaching? Some of them were teaching in some of the synagogues in Brookline. They had connections. They were, yeah. Some people uh, were from so Brookline. Yeah, uh, I mean, Barry was from Brookline. A lot of them were doing Hebrew school stints there in Lexington. Um, it, uh, uh, it, in some ways, there was something natural about it, but uh, our client base was kids that had no uh, affiliation. Um, and in retrospect, it actually, for a few of them, I think, uh, was very important. Um, and, uh, but it was, I was going to live in Brookline because I was going to live in the community where I was doing this work, and that's uh, why uh, I moved from Somerville uh, in August of uh, 69 to Brookline Village. Um, and then there was this, uh, we had to find a, a, a place, uh, to uh, a venue, um, the the original venue we had was in Coolidge Corner, um, and uh, yeah, kids did come in. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm kind of su surprised. Uh, I'm not so sure that I thought it would happen, but and then kids would come in and uh, they would bring friends in. So there were nights at the drop in Center where we'd have 10, 15 kids there. Where was it? What was the space that you were using? It was in an office building. There's, what happened is, is that uh, Art forgot to sign the lease. And the, uh, so eventually after, I don't know, four or five months, the, um, the landlord who was actually uh, one of Nader's raiders. He, he was a great liberal lawyer. Uh, he, his father owned the building, and he came in and he said, you haven't signed the lease. Uh, other office people in this building say they smell pot coming from uh, the drop-in center. There was no pot, at least to my knowledge, in the drop-in center, so you gotta get out. And it kicked us out. We then moved closer to Brookline Village to a storefront. Uh, uh, right on Harvard Street? No, it was uh, Wait, yes, Brook, Street, oh, Brook, Brook Street. Street yeah. Brook Street right off of uh, Washington. It was near Aspen Wall. It was uh, off of uh, Harvard Avenue, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I think it was an old grocery store that we went into. Um, and while we had this idea that there'd be this candle making workshop and meditation and all that, maybe once or twice we did. Um, and I think that there were people in the Habara that came down, but they didn't, really didn't know what to do uh, when they got there because there, um, there was no curriculum. Uh, kids would just come in and talk. Um, they would... Um, uh, it, it, there was some meditation that went on. Um, uh, I mean, I had absolutely no training as a social worker, but they, they would want to just talk to me about what was going on in their lives. Um, and uh, one of them, um, I ended up to be the best man at his wedding, uh, Jonathan Greenberg. Um, son of an Orthodox rabbi, um, uh, was totally disillusioned with anything Jewish, and uh, was into Eastern religion, and uh, he, he, he really wanted to be there, 
And I remember once, this was after we were married, uh, he brought a whole group of kids to our apartment uh, for a meditation sent, uh, session at night. And then in the morning, he did some uh, meditation while we uh, uh I think it was a Shabbos morning, while we dovened, or maybe I put tefillin on. But it was uh, <laughs> two religious events going on at the same time. And this, for him, it had a big effect. Uh, for some of the kids who were from very, uh, uh, very dysfunctional homes, they liked to, uh, to be there. For the November 69 March, a group of kids came down, and the parents allowed them to come down because I was going to be their uh, chaperone or whatever. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I remember the October 15, 69 March. Um, it, it was, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, October 15th, where people, it was an anti-war day, and people would leave schools, and I remember leading a group. The moratorium. Of the moratorium okay. day. Yeah. Uh, people would leave uh, Brookline High, and, I, and we went with them. Uh, I think for a few of the kids, and Jonathan it certainly did, uh, Jonathan Greenberg, it had uh, a, a it was an important place to be. In terms of social action for the Havara, it wasn't. Was this a collective decision on the part of the Havara yeah, but to it do was, this? Well, after this uh, our monastic silence dinner, we went outside. I think uh, I, maybe I had the idea that we had a, a, a bonfire, a campfire. But around the campfire, I <laughs> God. <laughs> This is funny. I read some Dietrich Bonhoeffer and then talked about having a drop in center. <laughs> um, uh, and it was, they were gilded into it. Gilted. You know, gilted. They wanted, you know, okay, Steph, you want something, you can have it. Some of the people in Dorton did participate, uh, did come down and help. Uh, but I think most of the non-Norton people, maybe a few of them came down once or twice. The, the decision- so was, it, was it mainly you? It was mainly me. It, it, it was me. Uh, and the next year, uh, I, I, I probably you know that there was dad forth money that went into the, the hover on. Uh, that Art was going to put in a proposal for a second year or a renewal of funding for the Havara. And in it, he was going to include uh, the drop in center. That was going to be a big draw. And I said, no, uh, uh, that you know, it's really not a Havara thing. You, you can't include it. Uh, so it became. Almost your personal it, it, it did. social activism. That's it. Uh, and Mary, were you involved in it? Um, yeah, I was. I was. Yeah, trying to think. I guess when I was there, when I came out finally, the kids were still kind of coming over once in a while. But I, I mean, I don't remember. Oh, you remember, uh, remember with we Charlie were, Manning? At oh, the, it's Charlie, right? And with I remember getting. I was there when you were getting the second site ready. You know, uh, getting it ready to be used. Um, but I don't, I don't really, I think by the time I really moved out there, it was, I think that you'd, you'd lost that space too, right? How long did you have that no, space? we had that space uh, for a long while uh, uh, until we left the Havara. So it, it was yeah, till May, June of, six, of 70. Oh, okay. Because because uh, I came out, I was out, came out in Jan I was there in January. Yeah. Yeah. We I mean, I don't remember. We really talked about the beginnings yeah. of Dorton and what Dorton was. So, these three 
families, uh, Steve and Sue Jenden, uh, Jeff and Terry Sokol, and Charles Code and Kathleen Martindale had been accepted at they to the Havara, that contentious March meeting. And they were the folks that really wanted something communal. Uh, I think it, it's good to talk about each of them and where they were at. Steve uh, was a graduate of the University of Chicago. He had uh, studied uh, uh, psychology and was very interested in Eastern uh, religion. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he and Sue had married uh, right before coming to the Havara. Susan, what was her area? Yeah. Well, she opened a graphic design business, but I can't. She was she was kind of artsy. I I, I don't remember what her college major was, but she was okay. very artistically inclined. Uh, and uh, they were very much while they wanted communal living, they also uh, wanted to have a certain uh, yeah, one of the religious uh, community. Where they, where they could be involved in a spiritual quest. Terry and ya, uh, and Jeff uh, were uh, yippies from uh, California, uh, and uh, they, I believe, they had been involved with Karl Bach, uh, and uh, uh, they. As they were in the Havara, they became much, much more observant. Uh, and then Charles uh, has a PhD in physics, uh, uh, and uh, Kathleen uh, eventually got a PhD uh, in English literature. Really sharp people that thems not a, a, were not in, were again involved with. Uh, with spiritual issues, but like the Gendids, in terms of uh, kind of the psychological uh, 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 ramifications of it. So when they came, I'm not sure how they came together, but when they came, they decided to buy the, to rent this house. And the house was kitty corner from the uh, Havara. I'm not sure exactly how they came together in this house, but uh, they, uh, it, it, what brought them together was they were new to the Havara. Um, they had some common uh, interest in a more cu a communal, and uh, I, th I think the, the whole Eastern religion uh, uh, spiritual quest was important for them. Um, and from the beginning, actually the name Dorton, I have heard, came from Zalman, who said that Dorton in Yiddish means over there, and uh, that uh, people in the, the other people in the Havara would talk about them as being over there. And from the beginning, they were over there. And I think they felt very much uh, we, they, uh, feeling. Um, none of them were very interested politically. I can remember Steve and I having big arguments in which Steve would say um, that uh, basically politics doesn't matter, you know, that, that the world <laughs> the world is crappy, that's, that's what it is. Uh, but uh, I think because these uh, people wanted something different than a graduate degree in Jewish studies, I was attracted to them. Uh, and so was uh, uh, Jim Kugel. And uh, Noam, who also wasn't getting a a degree was was interested. So we would hang out over there. 
Um, and I think from the beginning, there was a feeling that somehow they had not been, they had been sold a, a bill of goods about what the Havarau was, maybe a little bit like I felt um, that they thought that the Havarau was going to be more than that. Did the did Dorton exist when you came into the cover? At what point did this all? Oh happen? no, this all began in the fall of '69, because um, they were accepted to the Havara in March at that meeting, and then they came that summer, late that summer, and moved into the house together. So they were part of year two, essentially the year two class. So That's it. That's it. And uh, they, uh, I mean, at, at least I came from um, a background in which I, in terms of prayer, in terms of observance, I was, uh, it was a part of me. For all of them, uh, Kathleen, uh, was a convert, and uh, the rest of them really hadn't had much of a family background. So um, they felt even more distance, I think. They, they could not lead davening. Um, uh, they, uh, boy, the, I can't. It's not that, that I think people look down on them, but they looked at them as other, hence the name Dorton. Um, and uh, sometime in the fall, because all of our Hebrew knowledge was uh, very limited, we began to have what was called the Beit Midrash. Um, which was every morning we would get together and we would study uh, Shemot with Rashi. Um, and people in the Havara who had knowledge would come and would, uh, would learn with us, or would teach us. Um, and that included Joel Rosenberg and uh, uh, Michael Swirsky and um, uh, art. Um, and uh, from those, and then um, sometime, I think it was in January of 70, uh, Michael Paley joined us. Michael was a student at Brookline High. And uh, I, I don't know how he got the permission to do it, but he, well, knowing Michael, he was able to do it. Uh, he was able to get the, uh, uh, them to, uh, the administration to agree that he could learn with us. So he would pick me up in Brookline Village, and then we would drive together out to do uh, at that time it was Dorton when we were studying, and he would join the discussion. Part of the discussion at, was not after, the te after we did some learning, would be grousing about the Havarau and where it was at, um, and that it wasn't what, what we wanted it to be. Um, and sometime, and I I'm not exactly sure when. Michael Paley actually has a diary, a journal, of his time uh, in Dorton, which it might be interesting to look at. Uh, sometime in uh, January, February of 70, we moved from the Havara to, uh, to Dorton, and that's where we would do our learning and our browsing. Sometime, say that again, sometime in... In January, February of 70. Now this was an, a, much after our 
marriage. Uh, we began meeting in, uh, at Dorton for the Beit Midrash. Prior to that, it had been in the At, at the, the Havara, Havara building. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and, I mean, we continued our learning, but it became much more... Uh, Michael read me some passages from the journal. It was like... Um, uh, Steph came back from a Havara meeting last night, and he said that this happened at that meeting. And you know, then we discussed what, what, what we were going to do. So he was the anthropologist uh, for what we were doing. Was he part of the meetings at that point or not? No, uh, because Michael was uh, not in the Havara. Yeah, he, uh, he, he was hanging he was around. He this junior fellow traveler, so to speak. That's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this high school kid. He was still in his senior year. Yeah, who, who was uh, who was with us, uh, and then about. Oh, okay, let me uh, ask one other question though. Yeah. Were the members of Dorton participating in the in the Chavara yeah. weekly meetings and meals and all of that at that point? Uh, yeah, I think so, um, but they were becoming more and more disenchanted. I mean. Maybe this is my own uh, false memory, but I always felt like I was still there, maybe because I had been there from uh, basically from the beginning. Um, uh, and in many ways, uh, I felt connected to some people. I think they never, it was rare that they felt um, much intimacy with with the folks in the Havara. Um The wedding, as I said, was a time where both groups came together, and uh, I know that the people in Dorton did some of the cooking, and um, the, they were very. Uh, but it, it's a turning point at the wedding because right after that, things started to fall apart very quickly. What, what efforts were members of the Chavura, if any, making to try and truly integrate these new members? These were people whom they had accepted into, their, into the Chavura in the second year. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I, I'm sure that people were invited over for Shabbos dinners. Um, on the other hand, it was like the three couples were one couple. Uh, so, uh, in terms of people, yeah, people of the way they, they looked at them, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Jeff at that time was becoming more and more observant and uh, orthodox in his practice. Uh, he went from Chavra Shalom to Lakewood, New Jersey, uh, and became part of the Haredi community. Uh, and, uh, I mean, quite, quite honestly, I think all of the three people, three couples in Dorton, the men were very uh, concerned about the draft, and that, that was one of the reasons why they were there. I'm not saying that was the reason they were there, but that that kind of kept them there. Um, what happened after they left the Havara, Charles had a very low number for the lottery, the draft lottery, and so he went to Canada. He moved to Canada. And, um, and Sue and Steve, I, don't, I think Steve had a high number. He went off to, the, I think the lottery was in December of 69. So, uh, People knew and knew where they stood, and he went off. Uh, they went off to uh, the Bay Area. Uh, after some time, and this was a, probably about the time that we moved our daily meet, Beit Midrash to uh, to Dorton, was when uh, Art had the idea of having these position papers and these meetings. And by that point, uh, some of the people in Dorton, I think, had had it. Um, and 
uh, one of the position papers which um, which I'll have scanned uh, was from Kathleen and I think that this said a lot about it. This is the Havira monster. He, she, he, she spews forth words which no one takes seriously anymore. Intense, authentic, radical, sensitive, committed, experimental. I'm not writing a, um, a protocol, I guess we call them protocols, because I'm pretty certain not to be here next year. This is one thing I'm fairly sure of. Love and trust cannot be legislated. People who cannot look into each other's eyes are not likely to be sharing anything important, whether it be time, space, roller skating, or making cholent. Kathleen. And then there's this ugly looking bird that's spewing. Uh, I think that says it. Um, now, there are a lot of other uh, of these protocols. Uh, the, uh, 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 people can peruse and see what other people had to say. But th th most of the, <laughs> why do they call it the mainstream hover on the non doing people? The mainstream were much. Uh, we're talking about how important it is to be part of a community, but not a, a communal uh, space, not a, not a commune. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this question of um, sort of the ideal of openness, which we're referring to here. Um, as an intentional community, the Chavarra, as I understand it, was striving for an ideal of openness. That is, an ability for to be to share with and be open to essentially all of the other members. And yet, in a, in a piece in response that was written at the end of the first year, 1669, um, one member described the Chavarra as, quote, racked by conflict between individuality and communality that this was a common struggle that people were feeling. This was also largely a male community. Uh, male, it was mainly men and their was, girl, girlfriends and, and wives in a few was, cases. Yeah, it was only men. Um, when we voted people in uh, for those first, for the first year going into the second year, we only voted on men and then the women would come along uh, Noam uh, came with a girlfriend, Debbie Wolin, all of a sudden. And Debbie, uh, when Noam broke up with Debbie, Debbie stayed on, but it, it kind of, <laughs> this no woman's land. I mean, it was, she, she would go to, to, par, uh, to, to dinners but I can never remember her being at a meeting. Um, uh, so, did the wives and the women come to the meetings? You know, that's I, I never went to one because I can remember Mona being at a meeting. You do remember. I do remember Mona being at a meeting. So, now whether they voted, I don't know. Um, the the vocal voices were were the men. Um. I don't remember ever going to a meeting. I mean, I, I don't. I just think I wasn't there at the time you were having meetings. But um, I mean, were there meetings? I guess there must have been one, but I don't remember going in January before we left. Yeah, I don't remember meetings, going to the, the meeting. Were every week. Yeah. Oh there no, I don't think I went to any of them. Wednesday communal meal and then meetings. No, I don't remember going to one. I mean, maybe I'm just not remembering, but I don't remember it. Yeah. I I, the only meetings I remember toward the end, besides these parlor meetings to discuss the, where the, uh, where the Habara should go, uh, we would, we would discuss who to elect to come in, who to accept. 
uh, and they that really brought out this uh, this tension of how how close we could be. I remember at one of the meetings, uh, and in some ways I think this kind of uh, encapsulated uh, the feelings of some people, is that Jimmy Sleeper yelled out, purity is bunk. Uh, and so it was this, you know, this ideal, which the one, which a lot of people thought could be met. And then there were those of us who uh, at least would spout the idea. Mary, you, much of your educational experience, your experience in general, mm -hmm. has been in all female right, schools right. and environments. What was it like for you to be in this intensely male Well, I, you know, I was, I, th I think everything, my limited contact was so, my contact was so limited it would be, you know, sporadically when I would come in and see stuff, that, and everything was so new to me that it, it, it kind of, um, I don't think I really noticed that it was all male, or because usually when I, when I was there, there would usually be the girlfriends and the wives would be around. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it didn't really, um, I register, I think. Um, and then, and then we were. I was just there for a very short time before we left, and I and I, I don't. I, mean, I guess it didn't make much of an impression because if I was there at all, I don't remember it. I remember going there on Shabbos. I may not have gone to the Wednesday things. I probably didn't. I'm not sure if it always. So, there was always a meeting on Wednesday night. Sometimes there were talks yeah. or things like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. But there was a, a weekly meal. There's a weekly meal. Yes. But I think about my knowledge. My Judaic knowledge was so limited, I don't think I would have felt um, uh, like nobody wanted to listen to my voice, because I don't think I would have felt like I had much to add, probably. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting in the context mm -hmm. of this discussion of sort of otherness, mm -hmm. how you felt as, as a new Jew. Yeah, I mean, I was, context. yeah, I think that that's just, that's, everything was so new to me um, that, that uh, these other things didn't really register. Yeah. There is one, I hesitate telling the story because I only have fragments of it, but I think it's important that the, the first year there was a member and his wife, and they had a kid. They were the only people with a kid. And they didn't live in Cambridge or nearby. Um, and he didn't come that often. And my memory is, is that he was kicked out of the Havara and lost his draft deferment. Um, now, I, uh, what, what's important with, for me with that, my memory of that, at least, is that um, there was a sense that he wasn't that involved, uh, involved enough, but that we would, we would not continue to have a relationship with him as odd. Yeah. In your letter to Mary that you sent me, you discuss this these feelings of alienation that you were feeling even in the first months there. And you use the term spiritual masturbation to describe um, what I understood to be the self-absorption of uh, members with their own spiritual experiences at the expense of active engagement mm -hmm. with the world around them. Was that one of your primary critiques as you were sort of getting into the Chavara experience? It is, although uh, I mean, to this day, the, the spiritual intensity of some of the experiences there are still with me. Um, but there was a sense of uh, people spending too much time looking at their own kishkas. There was... Um, Zalman, this was before I came, but uh, it was there when I was there. 
uh, took a Tupperware uh, 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 container and put Christmas lights in it and engraved on the Tupperware, uh, uh, out of the Tupperware top, you put yud hay vav hay and people would sit there looking at this uh, lights going off and on, colored lights of yud hay vav hay That was, was a lot of, it, it kind of, oh, you know, <laughs> we're, we're having some sort of spiritual high. Uh, Another example that you gave, which struck me, I have to say, in the letter was a description of a lab that was part of one of Zalman's uh, classes. Could, so tell us about that, 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 that what, what were these labs? And if you remember this story about meditating as a tree. Yeah. Can I look at my, can I refresh my recollection? There we are, right here. Thank you. Right in the middle, and you see it where there's a quote there. Okay. Yeah, uh, Zalbid would have us try to meditate in different ways. Uh, one day, actually, Shabbos morning, he said that should we have a davening in which we are all nude? And nude? Nude, and see what that's like in terms of our uh, uh, vulnerability. Uh, in this instance, uh, a lab at Tefila was that uh, we were a tree uh, and uh, think of ourselves as a tree and what would a tree be like. Uh, it's a connection with Tubishvet, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, as I was doing it, I was thinking about uh, the students that at that time would be expelled from the University of Chicago over a draft protest. Uh, I was thinking about the people in Vietnam, the people dying in Biafra, uh, and uh, I, uh, this is uh, Steph Krieger the contrarian, uh, there was a part of me I think that wanted to get into the tree business and I could, and I was thinking about what else we could be doing. Uh, and we, uh, I mean, when it came to the, the inner life, uh, I don't think there was anything that at that time for me could have been more uh, uh, impressive, more uh, uh, exceptional than, uh, than what we were attempting to do. At the same time, the outer world, uh, in some ways it was like Brookline Light and Power that I went, uh, that they were kind of doing it for guilt. Then the November 69 March was an odd thing because I, talking to some people now who were involved in it was such an important event, but at the time to get people to go to it, the, this anti uh, The mobilization. Mark, the mobilization on November 15, 69. To get people to go was very difficult. And once we were there, we were staying at the uh, the Reform Judaism Social Action Center, uh, and uh, which was near Dupont Circle, and, uh, and there were the police were police were gassing a lot of people uh, at night, and I get the sense of just real fear from a lot of the Havara people there. <laughs> And me, on the other hand, it was like, you know, this, I, we got to fight for this. Uh, so, but, but some of them came. And he, uh, actually, I can remember uh, two people from Dorton came down. So, uh, uh, what's it, a uh, Havara, uh, yes, what's it, a Havara, uh, anniversary, I turned to me and said, well, there were other people that were involved in social activism. And 
I think for art that was really important that there were, uh, certainly Jim and his work with the Jewish Peace Fellowship was. Uh, but I think in, in, in art's mind, it was so important that we not just be doing uh, the, uh, the inner stuff, but we never quite, at, at least in my estimation, had the kind of balance that I would have liked. Right. How would you describe the role of tefillah, where, where it stood in the sort of priorities of the community and um, how it related to your experience of prayer in other set settings, like in the upstairs Minion at the University of Chicago? Uh, um, yeah. Well, in terms of the difference of U of C at uh, Upstairs Minion at the Havara, it took it to another level. Uh, the Upstairs Minion was, there was poetry, we were experimenting. There, were, there was a lot of, uh, of creativity in what we were doing. Uh, Where? At, 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 I'm sorry, at Havara uh, uh What stands out for you? Uh, uh, the moment that stands out is the ELA 1969, uh, in which uh, I was standing almost right next to Art, uh, and he was leading, uh, you know, uh, very involved uh, with the tefillah, and it's rare in my life that I've ever had a spiritual moment like that. Uh, that I was, I was really, uh, I, I was moving. I, uh, uh, it, 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 it was extremely intense. Um, the Shabbos morning davening was was good. It was uh, there were some wonderful daveners. Uh, um, Larry Lofman, um, I still use some of the melodies that Larry did. Larry. Uh, yeah, just an upbeat guy from Texas uh, who uh, really brought a lot of joy to it. Uh, uh, Art uh, taught me an enormous amount. Zalman, the first year. Uh, uh, it, we, and, and what I liked about it, compared to the kind of doubling that I'm involved with now, is that um, in some ways, it was no holds barred that we that we could do a Latin American mass for Musaf. Uh, uh, it was um, uh, it wasn't like we were second guessing. I mean, th there were definitely uh, flaws, and we we definitely made mistakes. But it wasn't like we were dwelling on the mistakes, or you know it. When you ask the question, there was very little discussion about, well, what did we do right and what did we do wrong? It was very uh, uh, authentic, very organic. We just, we just did it. It seems um, like it was very experimental and if something worked, it worked. If it didn't work, people moved on. It that's it. That's it. Undue criticism, so to speak. Because yeah. The ethos was one of experimenting with innovative approaches and a bit of materials. It, it, it was. Our, our poems, we, we, when we read the Torah, uh, we put the Torah on a pillow on the floor and unrolled it. And I remember one older person who came from the outside and he said, how dare you put the Torah down on the ground? And it was Zalman who said, well, bringing it to the people. And, and then there was, at least I don't remember, any discussion, oh, should we have put it up or should we put it down? We did it. Um, Can you talk about the impact of Zalman on the style of uh, davening and in general? And um, he so really, well, he, I, took, I took a class with him, uh, and I, it, it's funny, I don't, even, I don't even remember what it was. Um, it was on. Um, it said one of the readings was, what, You Never Promised Me a Rose Garden? Was that, is that the name of the book? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, uh, 
kind of psychology and uh, and religion, but um, that wasn't. It was a good class, but he, in terms of tefillah, he really had an effect. Uh, um, had you ever experienced the use of nigunim the way it happened at the Chabura? No. I think perhaps we had done a little bit at the upstairs Midian. And why I'm saying that is, is we did, we started to do, we had this big binder of additional prayers and poems at the upstairs Minion. One of them was Yudi Nefesh, and the traditional melody has a nigan at the end. So I think we had done a little bit nothing like at the Havara. What was it like at the Havara? Uh, we would, it wasn't like hours of just doing the nigan over and over, but we would be on those pillows and we would be closing our eyes and we would be, uh, we would be chanting it, and the best part of it for me was listening to other people's voices, and and in some ways you you would kind of resonate with other with other folks, and I'm sure that was taught to us by Zalman, uh, taught in the sense that it was modeled for us by Zalman, um, and he would always have a. Uh, you know, a creative idea, including governing nude, uh, uh, which we never did, uh, for the record. Uh, but uh, uh, he was always searching for uh, uh, how we how we could increase a spiritual experience. Um, we, we started in, this was sometime in the winter of 69. Uh, we started a daily service. Um, that probably nobody, nobody knows about except for Art and me because for most of the time Art and I were the only ones there. Uh, I can remember schlepping in a Boston snow to the Havara and being there with him. And his idea for davening was really neat. Um, it was that each day of the week you would do one small section of the tefillah so that by the end of the week you did the whole thing, but that you would really intensely focus on this one part. And I mean, this was not Zalman, this was art, but it, it had a Zalman-esque quality to it. Many people have described the services at the Havara as neo-Hasidic. Would you agree with that? What, what kinds of elements from the Jewish mystical tradition were brought uh, in? Nigun, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the almost meditative, uh, sense of, of trying to elevate the soul. Um, we used uh, a nusach, a nusach safard, but Ashkenaz nusach safard, uh, siddur, so that's a kind of uh, Hasidic. Um, I, in terms of the nusach, we we played with it, uh, and so I'm not so, I'm not so sure if uh, traditional Hasid would uh, would like that. Um, neo, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with big letters for neo. Um, yeah, I think that um, we were. It wasn't just saying the words; it was trying to uh, trying to move somewhere. It's interesting. I don't believe we ever had. Um, Torah discussions like we did in the upstairs minion, although we would have people give, uh, do some learning um, during the discussion. What was the difference between the two different? Uh, much more cerebral at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I think that was a reflection of, of Danny, Danny Leifer, that. Um, uh, 
in, in terms of tefillah, it was um, while we would experiment, we would definitely critique what we were doing and um, uh, re the readings were much more uh, didactic than, uh, than we had at uh, Havarat Shalom. In terms of the words, saying the words, what do you recall about whether the pronunciation was Ashkenazic or, or Sephardic? It was or? Sephardic, I believe. Sephardic. It was mm -hmm. Sephardic. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I had come from an Ashkenaz home, and only when I went, got to Buffalo did I start learning Sephardic, mm -hmm. uh, the Sephardic pronunciation. But I don't remember anybody. I, I guess David Roski's would have, um, but by then I, I, I don't, I'm not so sure how much he, uh, what his knowledge of the tefillah was. So I, I think it was mostly Sephardic. In terms of uh, women's roles in public worship, we're talking about earlier women's roles in sort of the community more generally, but in terms of public worship, not what do you remember about that in, the, in these, this very early Not period? at all. Not, not at, at all. all. I don't remember women leading at all. Um, I do remember, um, <laughs> I had asked uh, Esther Tickton to do a, an aliyah, and I asked, and she turned me down, and I asked that Kathy. That was at the upstairs meeting. Right. Yeah. And I asked Kathy Green, and Kathy Green refused. Uh, at Havarat Shalom. And I remember talking to her about it and she, uh, later, and she was really going through some struggles about, you know, what, what her role should be. But there was, um... I, what about people like Mona or Gail Reamer? Gail was not in it at the time. Um, uh, Merle, uh, Feld, I don't think ever led anything. Um, I mean, the great mural story, which you, you may have heard, is that once at a retreat, and this would have been in 16, early 69, um, uh, the women always did the dishes, the women always got the food out, uh, and it was the end of a meal, and uh, Merle took Joey Reamer and me by our shoulders and dragged us into the kitchen and said, you do the, the dishes. Uh, so that, that's a sign of what was going on. Um, what, you were going to say something, Mary? Well, I just wondered if, uh, were women called to the Torah? Did they get Aliyah? I believe, well, you and I were called for a joint uh, Aliyah right. when we got married. Yeah. yeah. For, for, the for the earth, earth. Earth, yeah. And I believe women could be called. But were they? <laughs> and Shabbos morning were they? Do you remember? I think I'm almost sure they were, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Do you sure. recall any women wearing a talus? No. No. Not at all. Now, at the upstairs meeting, I think maybe one or two did, but I don't remember it. Or? To fill in, absolutely fill in. not. How about being counted in a minute? I think we did count them. Oh. People have described, I believe, a moment at a retreat where someone needed to say a, a um, who needed to say Kaddish, and there were nine men, and I forget which woman was said, what, what about counting me? And there was a decision made to count. Her. That would have been after I was there. Um, maybe we had enough enough men there. I don't remember. Yeah. Were you or other people, men in particular, in the Chavara aware of the stirrings of Jewish feminism, or, which really sort of became uh, more of a, a uh, an actual thing with the founding of Ezra and Nashim, which was a year later or so. I was because of my Reconstructionist background. Um, I, I mean, that I approached 
Esther that I approached Kathy was very much that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't see, um, in terms of just the roles of being, uh, let me finish it and then, I, the, in, in terms of being accept, women being accepted with men, uh, a couple being accepted to the Habra, I, I don't think it, I even thought about it. On the other hand, that the Reconstructionist Seminary was taking women, starting in 68, I believe, was, I, I thought of it was positive. But I didn't in any way say, well, why don't we reach out to women to have women be members of the Habra? Art Green described this very early period as a pre-feminist moment. I agree and I disagree. Where I disagree is, is I think it could have been. Um, that, you know, we were experimenting with tefila, we were experimenting in so many other ways, and this, this one we didn't. And, you know, look at uh, Mordechai Kaplan's daughter had a bat mitzvah in the 1920s. 22, I believe. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, women were leading davening at uh, the upstairs minion. Uh, and, at, and I believe Rabbi Benzion Gold was pushing for a much more egalitarian approach and practice down the road. At, at Harvard. Harvard. And yeah. what became the worship and study meeting. So I, I think it's, um, I think it's that we were not, this was not an issue that we, we were concerned about. And I, and I do think, um, uh, yeah, this may come across uh, uh, in a way that I don't mean it, but I, you know, I'll, I'll explain it. I think there was a homoerotic sense of the Havara. I think that there was a sense of these men together uh, in, a, uh, in a communal setting. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that there were openly gay men that were uh, having intimate relationships. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think it, that was it. But I think that there was something, and, and, and I think it's similar to a yeshiva, that um, we like to be together with these, uh, with our own gender, and I don't think we thought about uh, the, uh, Merle brought it to Joey and my attention, but we didn't think about the roles of women. Did that change things, Merle's action, in terms of the non-communal worship part of the I don't behavior? think so. I mean, she picked on two of the most uh, <laughs> kind of uh, powerless folk in the meeting. Nah. Uh, I don't remember ever kind of men and women coming together in the kitchen. Although men cooked. Yes. But, I mean, it, it does in terms of the, the, the grunt work of doing dishes. Stuff like that. Yeah. In addition to the creation of a spiritual community, certainly an intrinsic part of the Chabarah's concept was the role of study and learning. How would you describe the learning model at Chabarah Shalom? It too was very creative. It too was uh, 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 it was it was approaching text from a different perspective. On the other hand. Uh, having come from the University of Chicago, uh, 
the text study for for someone like me who was not knowledgeable in Hebrew was not at a very intense level. Now I think those folk that did have good uh, uh, Hebrew knowledge, that uh, Art would do some wonderful study of Hasidut with them. But um, I took a course with uh, Eddie, Eddie Feld on Sukkot, great readings, uh, readings that I actually still use for, uh, for circus. Um, I took a course in Tefillah with Bert Jacobson, um, and I, and there's stuff that I, I learned there that was great. But it wasn't, it wasn't on a level that you would expect from a graduate school. Intellectually. Into, um, Is that what you mean? Well, intellectually maybe, but it wasn't the intensity. In other words, it, it, we meet once a week. Um, I studied Devarim with, uh, with Buzzy. Uh, and we read some essays, that, there's an essay by Moshe Greenberg on, on sanctuaries that I think about often. Uh, and uh, uh, it, they were great readings, but it wasn't like, okay, read 100 pages this week and, um, and we're going to uh, go through uh, the text word by word and look at the philology and, and the rest. It was... Um, it certainly was beyond an adult education course, but it wasn't uh, something that, uh, you know, if I, I think I, I recognized pretty early on this wasn't going to be a place where I was going to get the kind of text study that would be a, what, I, what I would get in a seminary. How did the teaching style at the Chavarar compare to your experiences in other learning environments? As I said, Jewish learning environments. Jewish environment. Um, like classes with Max Tickton. Yeah, Victoria I, I think it was. Uh, I think it was probably about the level of Max and and Danny, but that was you know kind of extracurricular at the University of Chicago. Um, it wasn't. Um, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, odd, we didn't do any haverses. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Tom, I'm not sure about the Talmud class, because I was going to take it and I didn't take it, um, with Goldblatt, what's his name, Michael was it? Um, um, but, I cannot remember, except for the Beit Midrash, kind of uh, going through a very intense text study with commentary. What was the text study like at the Beit Midrash? It was, I mean, the, the teachers would come in and out. So we would read a line in Hebrew and then we would translate it for whoever was there and then they would discuss the translation and then we would go to Ra the Rashi on a, a particular verse in Shemot. Um, it wasn't, uh, it's probably something that uh, eighth and ninth graders are doing at a yeshiva. Uh, eighth and ninth, probably fifth and sixth graders are doing at a yeshiva. It wasn't, uh, Was this a, a widespread feeling? I, I know at the end of the first year, Art Green wrote a letter to the community calling the academic program, the, the Chavarra's, quote, most serious failure. I, I think so. I think he, I, th but see, uh, so many of those people were taking courses at Brandeis uh, or at Harvard, and, you know, that was the academic, and then this would be the, uh, uh, the Havura wa was some extra Jewish learning. Uh, was it ever for you a serious seminary? Did it ever have that filter? Never. 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 Okay. 
And, and some of it's me. You know, I, I could have demanded it, and maybe somebody would have given it to me. But I, I don't think people had the time for it. To come back to social activism for a minute, um, the Six Day War had happened, as we said at the end of your junior year. How would you describe your relationship to Israel and the role Zionism played in your in your own Jewish identity at the time you were involved in Chavrot Shalom? Very little, um, and I'm not sure if it did for many people in the Havara. Uh, I mean, as I as I said in the questionnaire to you when I was a kid, my mom had this book uh, called "They Are Human Too" about Palestinian refugees. And she showed it to me and she said, remember these people as well as our people, that affected me. Um, I'm, I think that I felt an attachment to Israel uh, uh, through college and at the Havara, but I never had the urge to go there uh, at the time. And, um, I remember very little discussion about either politically what was going on there. This was pre Bre Ra. 1973. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, when Bre Ra began, I was, I, I was supportive of it. I was not involved with it at all. Um, but, uh, I, I can't remember, even for something like Tubish Vought, that we would spend much time talking about, about Israel. Okay. So let's, let's talk about what you've called the your expulsion, or the expulsion of Dorton from the Havara. So you were, you were members, from what I'm understanding, basically from December of 68, and you a year later, to for about a year and a half till the spring, late spring of seventy. Yeah. So what happened? <laughs> As part of the with all this protocol, uh, uh, the these papers, uh, I think that some of us felt, and the Dorton people and some others, that the the this was not the place for us if we wanted the Ted's community. And then, kind of a bizarre uh, <laughs> uh, issue came up for us, which came the country versus the city. This had nothing to do with Havarat Shalom, but that and the people in Dorton, uh, Noam and, uh, and Ruby Kornfeld, uh, and uh, and Jim, Jim Kogel, I don't think there's anybody else in this discussion, that can, can we help the world best by being in the country as farmers or uh, you know, living off the land, or city activists? You know, when we ended up, we were with the, the city activists. Noah and Ruby ended up moving to Drakeit, Massachusetts. Uh, to, supposedly start a farm. So, so, but what we had is these long discussions that, the, uh, as this was the outgrowth of, uh, of the Midrash uh, Krausing, of what we were going to do with our lives now that we were going to be leaving the Havara. And was it, that a foregone conclusion that, that you were I going to I think it was it? pretty, I think early in 1970 there was a sense we should go. And uh, there's, uh, I, had, I had heard this, uh, this is all hearsay, but that someone had told Art Green, you just have to purge these people. Uh, and I, you know, if you, I, I, I'm not, I should be in the business of trying to uh, psychoanalyze art, but it's kind of like purge that part of himself as well. That, because he, uh, there was a connection that he felt with us and, 
and that was one of the reasons he wanted the Havarad to begin. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't working. Uh, I, I think at one point he said he feels like we were stabbing him in the back all the time. Uh, and so uh, uh, I don't believe that the Dorton people came to these meetings. I came to one was, uh, uh, was very despondent after it. And these were community meetings where we were what discussing to what to do. To all these uh, the position papers. the position papers and there were all I think the way that art did it was there would be only a certain number of people at each of these sessions uh, and so uh, at that point uh, we thought we're going I think that uh, uh, it wasn't a in no way was it a public pronouncement, we are leaving, or you should go. But I think it was like uh, a marriage which wasn't working, uh, and the Dorton people left, and uh, Noah and Ruby went up to drink it. To and start a farm? To thing? start a farm, uh, and then to travel the world for many years to come. Uh, and uh, then uh, Mary and I, Mary already had a job, I decided to get a job uh, as a storyteller. Uh, and, uh, and that was it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I felt a great deal of bitterness. Uh, and, uh, I had very little contact with anybody from the Havara uh, until very recently uh, when the 25th, was it the 25th? No, it was the 35th. I don't remember. It was the 35th anniversary of the Havara came up. We were invited at, uh, to the reunion. To the reu I'm sorry, to the reunion. And, uh, I said to Mary, let's go, <laughs> and she was... I was shocked. <laughs> I said, why, you, <laughs> you, you've been, you know, upset with the Havara for all these years, why do you want to go? Um, and I went, and as I went, as I, we got closer and closer, I said to myself, oh, this is the worst thing that ever could have happened. And I just had a wonderful time, just a terrific time. Um, and I, I some of it is is that these are people that I knew at a very important part of my life, uh, and uh, <laughs> this will be strange. <laughs> it's strange to say, but they like me. <laughs> um, at one point, after one of the sessions at the anniversary, where the uh, with some young folk, young folk, people in the Navarra, you know, 10, 15 years later spoke. Buzzy Fishman came up to me, gave me a hug and said, they don't understand, do they? They don't understand. Mm. And I don't know what it is they don't understand, but it was like we had been through something together. Uh, and as bitter as I might have felt, in some ways still feel, uh, uh, we, got, we got something. I got a lot out of it. Um, before we go on to what you got out of it, at what point did you abandon your idea of becoming a rabbi, and how, if at all, does your experience in the Chavura affect that decision? Greatly. Uh, the one time, that for any length of time, I did not put on to fill it every day, was at Chavura Shalom. Uh, probably for two or three months. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it was be uh, maybe it was because I felt like I was doing stuff in my Jewish life. But I don't think it was that. It was that other people were doing it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I I had a talk with Max Tickton during this time in which I, uh, there's that line of Pirkei Avot, not to use the 
Torah as a spade. And I wanted to know how he had made uh, decisions in his life to reconcile himself with that. I think that's what I was, uh, that I was struggling with, that the more that I thought of being a professional Jew, the more that I thought of being a part of the Jewish community, the less I felt like being a rabbi, that I wanted to be, I didn't want to be in this, uh, in this very parochial, closed community. Uh, and uh, that I could say I am so happy with. Because I think that the not having my day in and day out life being my Jewish life, although it is, <laughs> you know, uh, but to fill in uh, doing Daf Yomi at night, I, it is really what consumes me. But I love to be, uh, I love to be around non Jews, to be doing stuff that is not uh, yeah, directly involved uh, with Jewish study. Uh, and I think that's what I learned in the Havara. In the end, you decided to become a lawyer. Yes. How did you make that decision? Uh, Why a lawyer? The t for the two years after I left the Havara, this was, let's see, I left in 70, and uh, at that point I had to get a job. And I got a job as a storyteller, a ch children's librarian at a library in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Uh, which, I don't know what Roxbury is like now, but it was, uh, a low-income black neighborhood, so. and I was, uh, uh, kids would come in and I would tell stories every day uh, to them, uh, and I loved it. Uh, and then, Barry and I, I think, thought we have to grow up. And <laughs> <laughs> the reality does sit in. Yeah, and what are we going to do? And I, I flirted for a bit with being a doctor. Although I don't have much, did not have the science background, I would have had to add it. And then we got involved with a red strike at our building at Brookline Village. Uh, and uh, I started to see, because of the lousy representation we got from our lawyer in that case, uh, what lawyers could do. Uh, and I wanted to be a a lawyer for poor people. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think it was, there was a sense that I can do something good in the world as a lawyer. I never thought of going off to uh, corporate law or anything like that. I was, uh, that I, you've spent your career, your legal career, representing low-income individuals and organizations and then teaching. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I, that kind of yeah, that's, I, I love that, um, uh, and I, I, I think if I, I, I never would have been able to survive in the Jewish community. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, first of all, I think I, I couldn't have stood the, uh, the, uh, just being around Jews, but beyond that, uh, my feelings about Israel, uh, it's, it, it's good what I did. While you were in the Chavara, one of the issues you grappled with was whether Judaism provided models, effective models, for your political activism. And, and as we've been discussing, you critiqued the Chavara community for not being adequately committed to social justice work. So how do you see those issues now? both looking back and in terms of your work, your, your life today, and the sort of interface, if any, between your Judaism and the kind of work you do and the social activism you're involved in. That was the one thing about that letter that, I, that really struck me. God, I, I had some insight back then. I don't think, I do not have a view of Judaism of Michael Lerner. I don't think that it's underlying this all is a left-wing agenda, uh, a progressive agenda. You could find texts 
about uh, Barry has said this because I said it I doing Daf Yobi in a fourth year. And there are pages, there are dafs, which Barry says has the trifecta. It's xenophobic, it's misogynist, and it's homophobic, all on the same page. It's all, it's re our tradition is replete with that. And to say that, well, anything different from that is, is that, that there are, obviously there are other good components that are, that are much better. But to say that that's all that we are is the better parts, I think it's just wrong. Uh, and so what I liked of what I said back then is that I think that what I can bring from it what it can inspire me to do is, uh, is the things that I do in my life that I, that I think have some sort of effect. But I don't, I, I would say they're inspired by my Jewish life, but I don't, uh, I can't say chapter and verse where it comes from. Uh, and uh, Danny wants, taught me that uh, while in uh, Isaiah it says to beat your swords into plowshares, there's a, a verse in Joel to, uh, that you should beat your plowshares into swords. We have both of those in our tradition, which, as Danny said, the one that has resonated the most is Isaiah, but still Joel's there. And uh, so for me, uh, what it has done is uh, it is it's given me a story by which I can do my work. It's given me some meaning. Uh, whether it gives that same meaning to everybody else, I'm sure it doesn't. So in the years since your involvement with Kabarot Shalom, you've, you've both continued to be involved with Kabarot in various places where you've lived. What did you take from your experience at Kabarot Shalom, despite all the things that you were contending with, that continued to shape your Jewish life over the years? Well, I don't know. I think in each of the Kabarot that we belong to, there was a participatory sense and an informality in the davening. And, um, and a, actually, in, in the Havre Road, a real sense of community, I think, in each of them. Maybe you want to mention some of the, the particular Havre Road, so. Uh, we were, at, when we were in law school and Mary was in grad school, we were part of uh, Havre Rock kind of Minion uh, at the University of Illinois, where Eddie Fell uh, was the rabbi for the first year. Uh, and then when we moved to Chicago in 75, we became involved, we, we created uh, at a synagogue in Rogers Park, um, Minion Shaney. Um, uh, and this was the rabbi at that shul. Uh, was terrific. Uh, it was a dying congregation. Yeah. And he just said, we, we came and he said, why don't you and this other couple start a, <laughs> uh, uh, our own minion. <laughs> we, we, we met in what was the youth lounge, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, which yeah. was not used anymore. And we really built a, a, uh, a nice little uh, uh, minion, and then we did some study together. And then um, in Dallas, uh, well, we also then we moved to Oak oh, Park yeah, in right. the Chicago area, and we start when we wound up. We joined, I guess we we joined the local synagogue for a while, and that was didn't go didn't go well. We were kicked we, out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's another story. But a group of young families started a, a small Havara like um, uh, Havara uh, sort of minion, and um, that lasted for, I don't know, 25 20, years, yeah. apparently, uh, well after we left. And then when we got to Dallas, we helped to start an alternative media at a very large synagogue there, uh, the largest conservative synagogue in Dallas. Uh, 
uh, Sherith Israel. Uh, the rabbis there were great. Uh, and I mean, f for many of those bidyadim, uh, it was uh, it was really tefillah, but especially in Rogers Park and in, in Oak Park, Park, we were very close personally with everyone. The kids mm -hmm. uh, would play together on uh, Shabbos afternoon. And, uh, and now that you're back in New York, <sighs> a strange thing. We when we came back, we went, we moved to Long Island so that I could be close to work, and. We joined a suburban congregation of uh, the Jewish Community Center of West Hempstead. And we did some creative programming there. I was, well, I became president of this congregation. Uh, and uh, Mary was president of Sisterhood. And uh, we, we started a Tikkulah Al Shavuot, an all night study session for Shavuot. We did a Tubishwat Seder. Uh, we, we started a Havara program to reach out to unaffiliated. Uh, uh, but it was, I, I could go through all the great things we, creative things we did, but it was really a superb congregation. Uh, uh, we invited, <laughs> for the Israel Bond dinner one year, they, they were going to honor both of us. And I said, we said, we would only agree to that if we could pick the speaker, and we picked Max. Uh, Max came in. He was, it was a bit controversial with, uh, uh, with the Hawks. Uh, but our son told Max that I sat on the Biba every Shabbos as peasant of the shul, and Max was so disappointed that, <laughs> that this is what had become of me. <laughs> Uh, uh, we uh, we moved to the city. We had had an apartment in the city starting in 2004. We're members of B'nai Jasherad. Things did click at B'nai Jasherad, although the Dominic is superb. And so we're now at Midyan Ma'at, which has a lot of, uh, of veterans of uh, Habarat Shalom. I'm now the Davide coordinator, and I've tried to uh, re-inspire the Davide, and the responses are, to, it's fascinating, you know. Uh, I had a, a training session, a, a workshop on Davide with Jan Bach, who's a wonderful teacher on, uh, on spiritual Davide, and she recommended, for example, that we do poetry in the Davide, and the response <laughs> was so negative. I mean, there were some people positive, negative, but it's it's odd that this is where we've come, because the davening at Havarat Shalom was so it was at such a different level than what it is here. Uh, but maybe we've all grown. <laughs> so when you look back at the Chavarah's vision regarding community and prayer and social justice and learning, what, what do you see as its greatest strengths? I think its greatest strength, and I think each of us should answer it, but I think it was that it, it did create a model for other communities. Our son is a member of Lobdib, which is Chavarah in Chicago, in which people uh, in, a non, in the non-formality of a synagogue, get together and daven and uh, can have Shabbos together and can support each other uh, in sad times of their lives and uh, rejoice uh, at others. But that uh, it's, uh, it's a way of having intentional community, uh, not at all uh, communal life like I had envisioned, but uh, uh, a way of, of supporting, enjoying being together. Yeah, I think that, um, that the, the idea of trying to create a community, in a, even if it's within a bigger institution, is very powerful. And I think that um, 
you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that there was a lot of talk about community in the 60s, and I don't, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's um, directly from the Havara, but I think that that is something that people need and that people look for, and that that's, that's something that's important. So overall, do you think Havara Shalom actually played a significant role in American Jewish life? This is a question you wanted to answer. I think in terms of the model for these communities, even within large structures, yes. In terms of, and, and, and that's an accomplishment. Uh, I think that if you look at the uh, intellectual leaders, uh, scholars, uh, in the Jewish community now, Buzzy, Art, Berry, David Roskies. Uh, I'm talking about people when I was there, Steve Mitchell, uh, that's uh, Jim Kugel, uh, Hillel Levine. Uh, that's really uh, uh, powerful stuff. On the other hand, as somebody who has my own little academic niches, I know that academic niches are not necessarily what That, that important in the long trajectory of history. Uh, so I don't know, I, I think there are some who have a bit of an inflated view that because of, uh, from those years, there are these great biblical and mystical scholars that uh, the Havara was, uh, had this major impact. I don't think it's impacts the academic world. Uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's elsewhere. I do think that uh, Arthur, that he was able to bring all these people together, uh, is an exceptional human being. Uh, and, uh, uh, whatever uh, conflicts I have had with him over the years, uh, uh, he, uh, he is a major force in the last 50 years of Jewish history. The rest of us, I think, uh, don't quite make it, but that's okay. <laughs> and finally, since since leaving Chavarot Shalom, you've been active in a variety of social justice organizations and, advo and advocacy groups, most recently as an active member of Jewish Voice for Peace, and you've also served on the steering committee of the Academic Council of Open Hillel. And during your time at Chavarot Shalom, as we've been discussing, you were very frustrated by its lack of commitment to, Jewish, to social justice activism in, in this Jewish context. And from your, so what I'm curious about is from your perspective today, as you think about um, social justice activism, political advocacy, and the kinds of groups that you've become involved with, and then you speak, think about the spiritual communities in the Jewish community that we've just been discussing, davening communities, etc. What do you see? What do you think about the relationship between those kinds of entities? It's funny that you ask that because we are involved in something now, which in many ways is attempting to combine the two. And uh, <laughs> I hate to say this on uh, on a video, but it's Donald Trump that we can thank for it. <laughs> uh, that after the his election and the January twenty first march in Washington, in we protest, thought, in pro oh, well, God. for <laughs> yeah. posterity, yes, mm -hmm. for protest, we, uh, we tried to get a hotel room there that we could walk to the march on Shabbos, and we could, it was $2,000 a night, uh, and so we looked into the New York march, and the New York march was starting in very far from here, so it would be difficult to walk. So we uh, 
uh, David and Shader Roskies and we at Thanksgiving came up with the idea of having a Shabbos friendly Upper West Side feeder contingent to the main barge. And the idea was that we would try to bring in all the denominations and, that, and especially to bring Orthodox folk into this. That, you know, at, at BJ and AJ, there's plenty of social justice stuff going on, but it, it, it can be difficult, especially in the modern uh, Orthodox community. And so we started to plan this thing. And, uh, and Mary and Shana are the ones that really put this thing together. And we ended up, we thought there were going to be 300 people in the barge. There were 3,000. From 40 synagogues. Up the, here? Up the, here. It's just yeah. from, in well, like some of them were in New Jersey, some of them were in, on Long Island, they were from all over. But they wanted but to be the part of a Jewish voice. And it was really, <laughs> I hate the, the word amazing because it's, oh, people overuse it, but it was an amazing morning. Uh, and we marched at that, that moment where the Jewish feeder march, that the main march, was, was really a phenomenal moment. And what we're doing now is we're attempting to build from that to build a Upper West Side Jewish contingent that can feed into other anti-Trump groups, uh, 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 Trump policy groups. And our goal is to do it so that we can bring, bring di disparate parts of the Jewish community together. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 I've been thinking about this, why, why a Jewish voice for, and I, maybe you, you have an answer, I guess the one that I have is, is that, uh, uh, that if we can have this local core of people that fill a community together, that we may be able to have more impact than just being involved in some sort of national organization. Yeah, well, and I think also it's, um, I think a Jewish voice at the table can be powerful in certain situations. So I think that's an argument for it. But I think on a local level, it's been, it's very, it's very, it's just personally very satisfying to work with people from different parts of the community that you, um, you feel uh, a connect. You start to feel connections with because you've talked to them, you've met them, and um, and to be able to work with them on something that we all think is important is really community like building. A different model, though, from what your your ideas were for the Chavara community way back in your Chavara Shalom days. It's very different. It, uh, it, it's not. We're not talking about setting up some sort of intimate community. Uh, we're talking about uh, setting up a community where people who uh, who may feel alone, especially in Orthodox schools, and this is what we learned from this, uh, that they can come out. They can come out of the closet and actually say they are against these policies to help them out. And then together uh, have a community. But it's not. It ain't have a so long. It's just an iteration of where we are now. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I mean, just I think in terms of community and communes, I think that 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 um, I think that's also not something that I think as one ages one looks for. <laughs> That, that what? That the, the, I think that the, the, the notions that one has of community when one is younger, like, a, you know, a commune, um, you know, that changes over time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what it means to raise kids communally, that changes over time. You know, you, you have certain ideas when you're young. I got to give it to Max and Esther that in their 40s, they became part of, they created a commune in, around their home in Hyde Park. Um, it wasn't easy, and I, I talked with Esther about it. But uh, boy, I don't think in my 40s I could have done it. So uh, you got to give it to them. Well, I want to thank you so much, both of you. It's been really wonderful talking to you. I've learned a great deal, and especially thank you for uh, everything that you've been able to tell us about 
Dorton and what that meant within the Chabara community and your reflections on everything that it's meant in your own lives and for the larger community since. We're very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.